Monster Hunter Frontier is notorious within the Monster Hunter community due to a lot of players that have not gotten to experience it, calling it not a real Monster Hunter game. Which makes some sense as it's a spin-off MMORPG designed for the Xbox 360 and Microsoft Windows service. Two consoles that never saw releases for the series by this point in time. I can think back to discussions on the game with other Monster Hunter fanatics and a lot of disdain surrounding some of the mechanics. But mostly the monster designs and their power levels as they get progressively more flamboyant and intricate in comparison to the grounded designs found within the mainline series. But maybe Frontier wasn't that bad. In fact, maybe through its development and updates and releases, it's actually an incredibly good, albeit difficult, Monster Hunter experience. Maybe some of these monster designs and mechanics are incredibly unique. Maybe some of these monsters would even make it over to the mainline series. Oh wait, that actually happened with Hypnocatrice and Lavasioth. This series of videos is coming from someone who never really got to play Frontier when it was alive. Yes, was alive, because as of writing this, the servers have been shut down and there's currently no real way to play Frontier legitimately, though there are people working on that. Together, you and I are going to look at the development of Monster Hunter Frontier, from its initial inception, to release, to the updates and expansions created for it. We'll dive into features offered in the series and try to compare gameplay to gameplay of mainline titles. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised with how intricate and interesting this game's combat was. Think old school Monster Hunter on crack. It's pretty wild, and I'm excited to show it to you. This first part in the history series will be focusing on the initial release of Monster Hunter Frontier and a lot of its major updates from Season 1 to 5. Future videos will focus on the final season updates from 6 to 10, the Forward 1 to Forward 5 updates, the G1 to G10 updates, and finally the Z slash Zenith releases. If you haven't watched my previous videos on the history of the series, I suggest you do so now. Additionally, if you enjoy these videos and want to help support the channel, please consider liking the video and subscribing. It just takes a couple of seconds and really helps boost the reach of the video to Monster Hunter fans everywhere. I'm Super Rad, and today I'm here to bring you a brief history of Monster Hunter Frontier. A quick note before we get started. These videos will be going in-depth about the history, development, and mechanics of Frontier specifically, as well as showcasing the monsters that were released throughout its lifetime. This is not an opinion piece about the difference in monster designs compared to mainline games, and shouldn't be taken as such. Rather, use these videos as a way of understanding what Frontier was like and to have something to point to if anyone ever asks you about it. Additionally, I won't be going deep into Mesoporta Square until the end of the series, as it will be better to look at the hub as a whole with all the changes implemented. Okay, so actual development history is hard to come by for this series. Originally, Frontier Season 1.0 was released for Microsoft Windows in Japan in 2007 and a Korean release in 2008. It'd be three years later in 2010 that the game would be ported over to the Xbox 360. By the time of the 360 release, it would have already been updated to Season 8.5. There was even a release in Taiwan, though this was translated by a third party. The actual Japanese version generally remained around 9 months ahead of the Taiwanese version, give or take, in terms of content. It wasn't impossible for Western players to get their hands on the game and give it a shot, but it could prove to be rather difficult. Take the Korean release for example. For whatever reason, the Korean game requires players to provide their valid social security numbers, which would be compared to a government database. This meant Western players had to get their hands on a real Korean social security number and essentially commit identity fraud in order to play. Luckily, the Japanese version only required a VPN, but back in 2007, those were still a bit more difficult to come by, unlike today where you can use something like NordVPN. No, I'm not sponsored by them, so don't worry. The game used built-in IP blockers to prevent players from outside of their respective country releases to be able to play without the use of one of these VPNs. One of the benefits of playing on the Korean server with a social security number was that the Korean release didn't require a monthly fee. When initially released, you could consider Monster Hunter Frontier to basically just be a re-release of Monster Hunter Dose. Players even started in the online hub town of Dundorma from Dose's release. This would later change to Mezaporta Square, which would be the main hub for the rest of future releases and would be updated throughout. The game seems to have had its first closed beta near the release of Monster Hunter Portable 2nd, and was meant to have an open beta release June 21st, 2007, but this was unfortunately postponed to June 28th, as a technical test was required. 
required. One major feature to notice during these beta and tests was how wards and worlds worked. Players new to the game and just starting out could join servers for players that were HR 15 or lower, generally known as tutorial wards. Other players would be able to go to wards that allowed access to players HR 30 or lower. This allowed players to focus on playing with people closer to their skill level if they wished. It wouldn't be until July 5th, 2007 that the initial release of Season 1.0 was finally available. Let's take a look at some of the key features and monster additions from Season 1 to Season 1.5. The main features introduced in Season 1.0 were two new monsters and a new area to hunt within. First up we have Hypnocatrice. If you watched my history video on the second generation of Monster Hunter, you may remember that two monsters originally introduced in Frontier made it over to the mainline portable series. One of these was Hypnocatrice, who only ever appeared outside of Frontier in one game, that being Monster Hunter Freedom Unite. It's a large bird wyvern that has the ability to knock players unconscious using its sleep sack and can deliver powerful kicks with its strong legs. Lavasioth was the second new addition to Monster Hunter and also made it over to mainline games through its initial appearance in Freedom Unite. Unlike Hypnocatrice, it managed to appear in future mainline releases in the series, but none of its subspecies or other Frontier-specific species have made it over as of yet. It's a Piscine Wyvern that can live and swim through lava, using the magma as armor around its body as it hardens. Hypnocatrice was available day one with the release of Frontier Season 1.0, but Lavasioth wouldn't be accessible until August 8th. This would be the general release plan for all major and minor updates. Release these updates with all of the new monsters and content, but only make new monsters and content accessible every month or so in order to boost the playtime and longevity of the series. You see this in a lot of other MMOs as well to keep the people subscribed. The other big addition was the inclusion of the Great Forest Area. This area also made it over to Freedom Unite and acts as a tropical rainforest setting the player will hunt monsters like Hypnocatrice in. Some of the events to make note of throughout Season 1.0's lifespan are the rollbacks required due to the inclusion of NProtect GameGuard, the anti-cheat software used to prevent players from hacking the game. Apparently there was some issues with its inclusion that caused some sort of crash, resulting in a rollback around August 17th, 2007. Following this, there was also a large series of bans in September that were apparently accused of being false and unjust. Also due to the poor implementation of NProtect GameGuard, which is notorious for being an awful anti-cheat software. I don't have many more details on these events as they were so long ago, but it wouldn't be the first time we've seen a game with a wave of bans that were not deserved. Along with all these new additions were monsters and areas previously seen in DOS. With the release of the 1.5 update on September 5th came other second generation monsters like Yan Garuga and Tigrex, although Scarred Yan Garuga is first gen. Along with the inclusion of returning monsters was the upgrade to Hunter Rank. Originally Hunter Rank could only go up to 50, but now could reach the 51 to 99 range. One thing to note is that the season's mechanic from DOS was also implemented by this point in the series. I won't go into detail about how it works, but if you want to know more, check out part 2 of my mainline history series which goes over all of it. One of the aspects of this mechanic is breeding season, and on December 5th, two new monster additions were added, those being breeding season Hypnocatrice and the Red Lavasioth subspecies. Breeding season Hypnocatrice is very similar to your typical, but is considered a variant, a male Hypnocatrice that changes its color to a more vibrant pink hue during the mating season. It's faster than your typical Hypnocatrice and more resistant to damage. Red Lavasioth is a subspecies. True to its name, it's almost completely red on the top portion of its body and is stronger and faster compared to your typical Lavasioth. It also has the ability to shoot a trio of magma balls at hunters. One final thing I won't go into too much detail about are gallery decorations, which were best in slot armor skill decorations players unlocked through designing a custom room within the game. Through customizing this room space, players would be gifted some of the best decorations in the game as well as farming upgrades through loyalty stamps players received through the creation and purchase of furniture. With these major additions out of the way, we can move on to the next major update, Season 2.0. Season 2 of Frontier was released January 30th, 2008 and really started to carve its own path in design and mechanics. In an interview, one of the developers stated, I wonder if the original concept of Monster Hunter Frontier finally started in 2.0. 
Some of the biggest additions included were the implementation of Hunter Rank 100 to 199, as well as a new flying wyvern known as Espinus, and multiple quality of life features that I won't be going into too much detail about. Espinus is similar in design to Rathian, being able to both breathe fire and expose the player to the poison ailment. It can also paralyze hunters as well. Its body is covered in large pink spikes where its poison resides. When enraged, its veins will glow and be visible, similar to a Tigrex. Its fireballs have the ability to cause both poison and paralysis at the same time, making them incredibly dangerous. It's typically fairly passive, but once enraged becomes incredibly aggressive and uses all of its abilities against hunters. Another big addition was the inclusion of SP weapons, armor, and decorations. SP weapons were low rarity weapons that were required for specific special quests that would unlock access to other quests through their completion. The SP armor players can unlock was special in that they had no armor skills and only decoration slots. To make up for this, SP decorations, which could only be used on SP armor were ridiculously strong. One could even offer plus 20 to expert. It can be noted that the addition of the variants and related new elements really marked a line in the sand for a lot of people about the direction that the series was going and a lot of traditional Monster Hunter players began to drop the series at this point due to the new features and various balancing issues. The unique mechanic of weapon length was also introduced. Weapons could now vary in length between five basic sizes from very short to very long. These lengths would affect the hitboxes of the weapon and generally the longer the weapon the more usable it was, with some incredibly short weapons not being usable at all. Generally long length was the most ideal. The 2.5 update was released April 23rd and brought with it a new Espina subspecies, featuring warmer reds and yellows around its body in comparison to the cooler greens and pinks. On top of producing larger fireballs, the subspecies was also able to launch them from its feet and create gigantic explosions. On top of this, instead of paralysis, it could now inflict the defense down ailment to really deal damage to hunters. 2.5 also raised the HR cap all the way up to 999, with players unlocking almost all available content around HR 100. It seems like the Hunter Festival was also introduced with this update, and was an event that lasted through the game's entire lifespan. The festival was a multi-week event, where every guild within the server would get assigned to either a red team or a blue team. It's a rather intricate competition, so I won't go into too much detail about it here, but teams would compete to collect more souls through hunting monsters and other various means, and by meeting certain thresholds would be offered rewards. The winning team would get access to special quests for a week after the competition, points could be earned and spent at a specific festival location attendant, which was incredibly useful for collecting rare G-rank monster parts. Some of the parts were only a 2% to 5% carve chance, so it was extremely useful. The point system specifically wasn't introduced until 3.0, however. Let's take a look at Season 3 now. Season 3 released July 2nd, 2008 and marked the one year anniversary of Frontier and included multiple new monsters, gameplay additions, and gameplay improvements. Felines had multiple updates and player customization was improved with multiple new hairstyles. The players also obtained more customization options for their player homes and armor color customization was finally introduced. It also brought with it a new hunting area known as Great Forest Peak, an arena area at the top of the giant tree within the Great Forest that was mostly home to the new Hypnocatrice edition by this point in the series. Speaking of that, 3.0 brought with it two new monster editions, one of these being Silver Hypnocatrice, a rare subspecies of Hypnocatrice which is much more powerful than its typical counterpart. It has better control over its sleep sack, more powerful kicks, and can cause tremors when it lands on the ground. Along with the new rare subspecies came Akura Vashimo, a brand new carapacean monster similar to a scorpion, with large crystals growing around its body. On top of paralysis, it can also inflict a new ailment called crystallization, where the player will be covered in crystals that must be shaken off. Their max stamina will be lowered to the lowest level possible, and if they don't shake them off in time, they'll explode. One mechanic I haven't mentioned yet is friendship skills, where players with similar name icons based on armor colors would get specific buffs when in a quest together. This was quickly made obsolete, however. Additionally, servers that required players to have a maximum rank, known as expert districts, were also abolished. This season was also when service started in Korea, although it only lasted there for three years. Season 3.5 released September 3rd, 2008, and brought with it a new monster as well as the inclusion of the Versus Quest mechanic in dailies. Akura Jebia was a new Carapacean similar to Akura Vishimu, but not a subspecies. Think Hermitar and Chianitar from the mainline games. It is white and blue in color in comparison to the purple of Vishimu, and can also inflict the crystallization status ailment. 
It's stronger and faster in comparison to Vishimu and can throw its crystals as explosive projectiles. Versus Quest functioned as a competitive race to hunt a monster the fastest. Within this mode, two groups of two would enter a single map together, however each team's map would be instanced. Basically the teams could see where the opponents were on the map, but not interact with them or their monsters. The goal seems to have been to hunt the target monster before the other team manages to do so, and players could use items on opposing teams for various negative effects. We're moving on to 4.0 now, and I just want to point out that all of these designs for monsters so far I could fully expect to see in any mainline Monster Hunter title. I think the series gets a lot of flack for its monster designs and gameplay, but realistically there's a good portion of the game by this point that any mainline hunter would enjoy. 4.0 was released December 17th, 2008. For a good amount of content up to this point, well-known video game producer Yoshinori Ono had been working on the series. Ono is best known for his work as producer and executive producer on many of the Street Fighter games, and was even the producer on the cancelled Deep Down title from Capcom. Ono stepped down during 4.0 and was replaced by Kazunori Sugiura, who has worked as a producer on many Pokemon titles including Mystery Dungeon, Masters, and Shuffle. First bit of new content to note is a new hunting area called the Gorge, which changed from a sunny day to rain and thunderstorms at night. The area features two specific types of cacti, which when consumed can offer defense and attack boosts to the player. It was also one of the first areas to have destructible environments that the player may need to get through to access the rest of the map, such as long tough grass that could only be destroyed through slashing weapons like Longsword. The next big addition was the inclusion of a new thunder element wyvern known as Beiru Kirurosu, a large flying wyvern with a single horn on the top of its head and long tendrils on each of its wings. It has many electrical attacks, but the most notable is the lightning beam it shoots similar to that of a Rajang. It has quest specific behaviors so it does not always act the same when hunted and when enraged could perform a dive bomb maneuver which creates a large explosion around the surrounding area. By this point, Beiru Kirurosu lives specifically within the new gorge area. Something to note as well is that previous monsters from mainline inclusions of the series were still being implemented within these updates. Not only that, but these monsters may even get reworked moves or new moves altogether. For example, Teostra was made more difficult by giving its fire breath a longer range and wider explosion area. Poogie also marked its inclusion as a support character by this point in the updates, but having it depart with you was dependent on a spawn rate. The Poogie could often get sick and refuse to go on quests, but there was ways to cure this. Similar to Palicos, Poogies could come out on missions and even be able to get extra monster carves out of hunts for you. Poogie even had its own skills to boost its effects when out in the field with you. Poogie could even consume potions instantly for hunters to heal them when they were in a pinch. It seems that at this point a time-based free-to-play mechanic was added, maybe a trial period of some sort, but it seems more like it was a severely limited free mode that locked players out of most of the content. The development team was also getting a lot of backlash from fans due to the broken promise of items never being purchasable. What those items are, I'm not sure, but adding a real currency shop left a bad taste in players' mouths. A lot of players at the time considered this a turning point for the series and was thought to cause a second wave of players dropping the game altogether. Despite this, it was revealed that there was actually an increase to player population at this time, most likely not from traditional mainline fans, but other players starting to see interest in the absurd power scaling. Season 5 was released on April 9th, 2009 and brought with it the removal of Dundorma and a renovation to Mezzaporta Square, further solidifying that Frontier was moving away from aspects of the old games. Pariapuria is a brand new water element flying wyvern introduced in this update. Surprisingly, it is not considered a Piscean wyvern or a leviathan despite its fish-like appearance. It's considered a glutton and will eat most food around it. After eating too much, it can regurgitate the food, which can then sometimes be gathered through by hunters for additional rewards. Hunters can actually gauge what type of food it wants to eat based on the color of its drool, and if constantly fed effectively, it will become overly full and be forced to ignore hunters and digest. Hunters can interrupt this by attacking or flinching the enemy, causing it to use the food within it as a weapon. 
Season 5.5 released June 17, 2009 and marked the second anniversary of the Frontier series. It not only brought a new rare species, but the intricate Rasta system. The Rasta system was a way for hunters to bring along AI companions into hunts instead of requiring additional real player characters. Rastas were available after HR 11 and by taking them with you on hunts, players would earn points which would allow them to buy better equipment for the Rastas. Players can set up their own Rastas, but have the ability to contract other players as well. How the Rastas function and act within a hunt is dependent on the hunters you are contracting from. The white Espinus rare species was finally introduced into the series with this release as well. It now has the ability to inflict poison, paralysis, and defense down ailments on top of its typical fire abilities. It has better accuracy with these moves as well. It has a super ability where it flies into the air and unleashes a huge poison fireball to the ground below. Players then need to trip the Espinus, otherwise the areas it stomps on will be left with a fiery poison area of effect, making hunter mobility more difficult. While the previous two Espinus have been rather passive until enraged, this rare species will be enraged as soon as it wakes up. Another inclusion to Season 5 are Hunter Gems or Hunter Pearls. Basically, hunters would have colors assigned to them, and each day, a monster type would be assigned to a specific color. Let's say that Elder Dragons were assigned to green. By hunting Elder Dragons, you would raise the points in that specific color. If you were assigned the green color, you could get bonus points as well. By raising the cap of all colors, you would be able to move on to the next rank of your Pearl, and there were 9 ranks in total. The level of your Pearl would correlate with the amount of extra bonus skills you could equip, such as not flinching when initially sighted by a monster, or no stamina reduction when climbing. This was done through the new caravan site area which included the required quests, known as caravan quests. Players would have to be at least HR 17 to participate. Capping the color to rank up the gem isn't the only requirement however. Players must earn caravan points and spend them to properly rank their gem up. If it hasn't been obvious by this point, Monster Hunter Frontier offered an incredible amount of content almost every month, and while the monsters started to get more intricate in both their design and abilities, the abilities of hunters did the same. From new decorations, new armors, new weapons, and abilities. Weapon length specifically is something I could definitely see in a mainline series, and the same can be said about the Rasta system. Maybe a system where we could take AI versions of friends we've made online and receive the guild cards of. I think a lot of hunters that hate on Frontier generally criticize it for similar reasons that I criticized World for. The series does in the future start to get faster paced, aggressive, and kind of absurd with the power of monsters and their abilities. But something you should keep in mind is that Frontier isn't a mainline game, and it's a cool look at what these developers have come up with and think about how they could be implemented into a mainline game. Even with how excessive some of the content gets in the future, looking at Frontier from 2007 to 2009, I can say that they really keep the atmosphere and the feel of the old school core monster Monster Hunter experience. As you can see by the category, we're going to be getting right into each season and covering what they brought to Frontier. In my previous video we discussed the development history pre-Frontier's release, but now that we're in the thick of it, we'll be discussing additions and design choices starting at Season 6 onward. September 16th marked the release of Season 6.0, which brought with it two new monsters that were hunted together, Nono and Kamu Orugarin. Similar to how players would hunt Tiastra and Lunastra together, or Rathian and Rathalos. Nono Orugarin is a wolf-like fanged beast with white fur. Nonos seem to always be female and hang around near Kamu Orugarin, which is a similar male equivalent with black fur. Both are ice elemental monsters, but this only seems to be the case in an update later on in the series through Monster Hunter G Genuine. Despite not being Elder Dragons, these monsters have the ability to evade pitfall traps. While similar to pairings like Tiastra and Lunastra, or Rathian and Rathalos, Nono and Kamu are unique in that they are designed to never leave each other's sides during the entire duration of the quest. Though there are quests in the future where they are hunted separately. When either of these monsters die, the remaining partner will let out a roar in despair and rage. Sword crystals seem to be added in this update as well. Think oils in Monster Hunter Generations. Essentially, if you had the specific armor skill, you'd be allowed to use sword crystals on your weapons and effectively change the element or ailment of the weapon at the cost of significant sharpness degradation. About three times the normal amount. However, this was only basically applied and didn't seem to be fully implemented within 6.0. Rastas previously didn't have the ability to use every weapon type, 
but this changes in Season 6.0. Now Rastas had access to all 11 weapons within the game. Finally, the introduction to Gao weapons seemed to appear within this update. These weapons required armor sets to get the most out of them. By equipping the weapon, each piece of related armor equipped would offer an additional plus 15 attack, plus 2% status, and plus 2% elemental. The Fist.moi website points out that this stacks per piece, allowing for a maximum of plus 80 attack, plus 10% status, and plus 10% elemental. These weapons were especially useful for gunners and defined the meta sets for them. The means of getting some of this equipment was through the inclusion of Gao Elders, which were previously released Elder Dragons from Dose that were a bit easier. Razor Sharp Plus 2 was also introduced. With all of these new features out of the way, let's move on to Season 7.0 and the introduction of a frontier staple monster, Raviente. Season 7 was released December 9th, 2009 and had a lot of new features added within. One major feature was the introduction of skill cuffs, which you would attach to your poogie to bestow armor skill points onto yourself. Think charms in traditional mainline Monster Hunter games, but without the randomization. You would create the cuffs you wanted and then attach them when necessary. Stamps were also introduced within this update and were used as a means of rewarding players for being consistently subbed to the game. Each week of a player's sub, they would receive a stamp which could be turned in for specific ticket items. Players can just be subbed normally to qualify either, they needed both the traditional sub and the extra EX sub to receive rewards. By collecting for a full year, players could use the tickets to purchase yearly equipment pieces, but I'm unsure of their effectiveness. So what's an EX sub? Implemented in earlier updates, EX course was an additional sub tier on top of your traditional HL or Hunter Life subscription model, and offered various bonuses to the player, like certain consumables always being purchasable and some expensive items becoming either free or 50% off. It also offered access to town boxes, which functioned similarly to current mainline games. Players without EX subscription would have to cancel a quest, run back to their house or smith, and get whatever they needed if they forgot items. EX placed these boxes within the town itself, making it easier to grab items without needing to abandon a quest. EX placed these boxes within the town itself, making it easier to grab items without needing to abandon a quest. A welcome inclusion that was unfortunately walled off as a paid service. EX even gated hairstyles of all things, and locked off specific gathering and material quests. So who is Raviente? Well, it's an incredibly large snake-like monster that does not have a typical classification. It's not a snake wyvern, and it's not an elder dragon, despite its enormous size. This monster was actually a server event and required multiple hunting groups of four to take it down, similar to what we see with sieges in Monster Hunter World. The monster was seriously enormous and was such a unique inclusion that there was even another EX service that could be on walk to help deal with hunting with it. Within the caravan area was a cat, and if you were taking part in the event, you could feed the cat specific items to offer boosts to everyone participating against Ravi, such as poisoning or sedating it. The monster had multiple phases, and after the fourth and seventh phase respectively, it would switch locations within the new area you hunted it in. There's many other smaller notes and nuances to this monster, but that will probably be saved for its own dedicated video. The new area is known as Solitude Island, and worked as three large arenas that Raviente would switch through throughout the phases. The hunters would start within the hunter camp and would move immediately to the main hunting area. Now, the wiki will tell you that hardcore monsters made their appearance in Season 7, which is incorrect. Rather, there were two monster variants that weren't actually classified as such, including Blangonga and Diablos. I believe Golden Rathian and Silver Rathalos were included as well. These were SP specific quests and not actually hardcore. The reason these weren't hardcore is because the true classification first showed up in Season 8. You'll understand why shortly. Season 8.0 released April 21st, 2010, and brought back the sub-updates with 8.5. The main features introduced in 8.0 were a new monster, and with it, a new arena area to fight it within. Diaragua is the new monster edition and an ice element flying wyvern. It is very similar in appearance to Tigrex, but the color scheme and horns help it also resemble a Xenogre. Despite this, it is said that the head resembles that of a fox. Its tail is large and blunt, similar to that of a club, which can smash down at opponents 
defense. Other than generic melee attacks, Dear Agua introduced Frostbite, which functioned similar to the Ice Blight ailment in mainline games. On top of Frostbite, it could also produce sleep after a backflip. Finally, the monster had the ability to stand in place and wait for hunters to attack it. If attacked, it would immediately perform a devastating counter move that would put hunters into an elevated stun state. Instead of the traditional stars over their heads, hunters would actually collapse to their knees for an extended period. Dear Agua was hunted within a new section of the tower known as the Nest Hole, which was, again, another arena location to hunt specific monsters in. Seemed like a going theme for the past few updates, honestly. It can be noted that in May, the Xbox 360 version of Frontier had its closed beta start after a short delay due to some sort of defect discovered within the game. An interesting note is that the player base apparently had an unexpectedly high amount of male characters being used compared to female characters. June 22, 2010 brought the Season 8.5 update and a few days later the full release of the Xbox 360 edition of Frontier. A subspecies of Beru Kirosu was introduced in 8.5 known as Dora Girosu. It offered an even more advanced moveset in comparison to your typical Beru. Despite using Dragon Element instead of Thunder, Doru has the ability to paralyze hunters. It has a more green hue to its body in comparison to Beru, who is more yellow and pink. This was also the third anniversary for the series and multiple events were held to celebrate. A big addition to note is that Season 8.0 was the first to introduce the concept of hardcore monsters, which were originally generally used to rework mainline monsters into more difficult variations, with multiple visual differences. To access hardcore monsters, you would need to turn the feature on when posting the quest for the original monster. These monsters weren't just stronger though, their part break thresholds were higher and traps barely worked on them, often lasting only around a second. They even only took half the normal status ailments and their carves were within the 1% to 5% range. Now to access hardcore monsters, you needed to have access to style rank and its requirement implies that styles were originally introduced in 8. Originally, style rank unlocked at HR 500, later 300, and finally HR 5 with some hunter rank reworks. Players could enter style rank and would be limited to what equipment they could use. They could even enter SR specific quests and set them to hardcore if they preferred. Now the benefit of this style rank was the introduction of weapon styles, which were completely reworked and new movesets for all the weapon types within the game. For example, players would now have access to the heaven style for each weapon and could change them by equipping a new item known as secret notes or secret book. These styles changed how the weapons functioned, but differently in comparison to styles from generations. While a generation specific style focused on a given theme that would be applied to all weapons similarly, the styles in Frontier were specific to the weapons equipped. Season 8 brought with it four new hardcore monsters. Hardcore Kongalala, which now has pink claws as well as a pink hue on the top of its head cone. It can now hurl multiple large pieces of dung at the player and will bounce around the area multiple times, unleashing large gas clouds as it does so. The gas is so powerful that it creates dragon strength wind. Hardcore Kezu. With brown spots and large blue veins around its body, it basically gets access to its electrical balls during multiple normal attacks it performs and can paralyze hunters with a short but powerful roar. Getting paralyzed can prove fatal considering how aggressive the attacks on this monster tend to be. Hardcore Lavasioth, which looks fairly similar to its normal counterpart, but has access to more fireball moves as well as a double body slam maneuver. Hardcore Yan Kutku, which is pinker overall and will charge and rampage around the map. Its main new ability is a fireball that will create a wall of fire after landing. Oh wow, we actually got a new full area in the Season 9.0 update which released September 29th, 2010. The new area was known as Highland and consists mostly of plateaus around rocky cliff sides. However, the area is incredibly high up and looking over the edge of the plateaus shows a sea of clouds. There are a few other locations of note within the area, with a small forest at the summit of the area and some caves that contain multiple stone pillars. It's a really beautiful spot and is covered in various waterfalls throughout. Highland is home to two new herbivores species introduced in Frontier, known as Yurupe and Baruku. Europe, or Europe, I'm not completely sure, are deer or antelope-like species similar to Kelby, and Baruku are similar to buffalo. 
Garenze Buru is a new flying wyvern introduced in Season 9 of Monster Hunter Frontier and has a sharp horned head similar to Zamtrios when it's in its ice armor form. It uses said horn as its primary means of attacking prey and hunters, often charging at them. It has a water element, which it uses to its advantage through attacks like water beams and balls, similar to Plesioth. It even has the iconic hip check maneuver. It has a paralysis gas it can release and can also shoot spikes into the ground from its tail which act as electrical landmines, but only when it is storming, which is fairly common within the highlands. They're actually fairly peaceful, but will become rather aggressive once attacked or if the weather is storming. Season 9 also had its own set of hardcore monsters and would be the first season to offer frontier specific monsters with hardcore status. Hardcore Biserios, which has a branch in one of its rocks on its back, as well as bright blue eyes and purple spots on its stomach. Not only can it fire three heat beams in succession, but now can roll and emit poison at the same time, as well as dig underground before resurfacing to shoot a powerful fireball. Hardcore Daimyo Hermitar, which looks similar to the normal monster but with new attacks, such as having a water beam of extended length, as well as running back and forth while swinging its claws around. The Espina subspecies also received a hardcore version, where the spikes around its body are now longer down its back and has more spikes overall on its wings. This hardcore species actually showed up before a hardcore Espinus, which arrives in Season 10. It can charge a large fireball that it will shoot into the sky before multiple other fireballs begin to rain down. Hardcore Hypnocatrice is more pink than orange and can produce stronger winds than your typical version. Hardcore Paria Puria has a darker, more saturated color scheme and has a vortex attack that can pull in hunters. It can perform multiple new moves after sucking a hunter in, like spinning vomit on them or swinging its head back and forth in a wider range. Why would you, why would you make a hardcore Plesia? It's cursed. Visually, it's very similar to your typical Plesioth, but with a darker tint and more muscle mass. It has a bunch of new aggressive moves, but the craziest thing is that it can U-turn mid-air when jumping. Hardcore Teostra is next and the first Hardcore Elder Dragon, with an even longer flamethrower attack than the updated Teostra for Frontier. He can also cover various areas of the map in explosive powder and make them explode at will. One other major feature is that he can cover himself in a fire tornado while roaring, entering rage mode or activating its fire aura. Hardcore Tigrex comes equipped with larger horns, but is missing one of its eyes. It has many new moves, but most notably its roar is stronger and has increased range. And it has the ability Ability to do a double 360 degree spin attack. One of the biggest additions to Season 10, which released January 26th, 2011, was weapons gaining additional moves and functionality. Some of these animations were actually reused for Monster Hunter Tri. The moat arena for Monster Hunter Freedom Unite was also brought over in this inclusion. Due to the amount of effort and design that went into each weapon receiving new moves, there was no additional flagship monster included with this update. However, there were plenty of hardcore monsters introduced which we will go over now. First we have Hardcore Azur Rathalos, whose spikes have been developed further than your typical monster and has the ability to spit out 7 fireballs in a row. Next is Hardcore Camellios, and the second Elder Dragon to have a hardcore variation. It has a sweet combo maneuver where it launches the hunter towards it and spits poison at them while they're in midair. Hardcore Diaragua has more vibrant color and more saturated horns and claws. It basically has all the same moves but doubled or tripled in use and they're even faster than before. The original Espinus finally received a hardcore variation as well. It's faster and stronger than your typical Espinus and has more pronounced bodily features. Hardcore Gypsuros has a larger tail and poison stains around its face. On top of being able to pretend it's dead, it can now also fake paralysis and fake sleep depending on which status ailments hunters are using at the time. Hardcore Kirin is surrounded by electricity at all times and has a large range of new electrical attacks that are even more accurate than before. One of its charge attacks is so fast it almost looks like it teleports. Hardcore Monoblos is a little more unique in design, with longer horns and red marks on the top of its head and horn. It has a ground slam maneuver and it can immediately charge out of it for a horn attack. For some reason, they thought it was a good idea to introduce a hardcore variation of Rajang. It has multiple new moves such as being able to spin around and leap across the entire area, and homing punches that will create electricity on impact. Hardcore Shogun Shianitar is a little more tame than Rajang and can spray poison from 
from the front and spit some from the back of its gravio shell. It can cause quakes while attacking which prevent the hunter from escaping. Hardcore Velocidrome has multiple small visual differences such as its new crest shape at the top of its head and its red eyes. It can also cause quakes like the Xeanitar and has multiple new tackle-like moves. And finally, Hardcore Yan Garuga, with a poison stained beak and new moves like performing a tail whip while also releasing a poison mist around it. It can also scream during some of these moves. Another thing to note about Season 10 is that it introduced Storm style, so players now had access to Heaven, Storm, and Earth. For clarification, Earth style is your basic run-of-the-mill moveset. On February 2nd, 2011, the Naked Hunter knife incident occurred, in which individuals who participated in the Raviente event were forced to HR 999, equipped with a Naked Hunter knife, and seemed to lose access to all of their equipment and items. Victims were left like this for weeks apparently, and these players were eventually rolled back after emergency maintenance. We've now officially covered all of the season's era of Monster Hunter Frontier. I think that the inclusion of the hardcore monsters is where we really start to see the excessive design aspects of monsters start to come to light, but this still isn't much different from what we would see in Deviants within generations. Even the flagships that get introduced don't come off as excessively designed to me. Rather, they again offer some features I'd like to see more of in future games, such as weather-specific moves or monsters having the ability to counter. The gimmick with Nana and Kamu would also be a fantastic inclusion for a new species within the mainline series. I guess what I'm trying to say is that you shouldn't vilify the series too much for the wrong reasons. A lot of the features we see in Frontier mirror a lot of the issues I had with Monster Hunter World, but their inclusion in this game seems more developed and acceptable for a non-mainline MMO. It's creative and cool and sticks to the old school style and controls we expect from older generation Monster Hunter games. It seems to manage to hold the atmosphere and aesthetic some of us miss within the series. Forward 1 was released April 20th, 2011, and marked the fourth anniversary of the series. One of the first big changes was renovations to various parts of Mesoporta Square. In the first video in the Frontier History series, it was mentioned that all of the footage in the square wouldn't be shown, and that's because it's hard to show all of those changes over time. Instead, on the final history video, we'll take a look at what you would consider the finished product for this game's hub area. In the meantime, let's take a look at some of the other features introduced. We're going to get right into the monsters with this one, starting with Ruko Diora, a brand new Elder Dragon to be introduced into the series and the first Frontier exclusive Elder Dragon to be seen. Naturally, the developers wanted to create a truly unique experience with his inclusions, giving it the brand new magnetism ailment. If inflicted, Ruko Diora had the ability to pull in or repel hunters at will. It can also summon a levitating rock that will circle around it for a limited period of time. For some reason, this monster isn't properly affected by the paralysis ailment, and whilst it can be inflicted, Ruko Diora can still move around. It has multiple other moves including generic claw attacks and dragon element magnetic sweeping beams. It's incredibly original in not only its actions and ailments, but also in its design, featuring bright yellow wings with an orange gradient and large horns which can be broken up to three times. Ruko can be fought in a brand new area known as the Interceptor's Base, which is similar in design to the town area from Monster Hunter Dos. Many parts of the area are destructible and as they fall apart, the scenery of the area will change with it, with areas becoming in in flames, as well as the surrounding air beginning to spark. Next on the monster list is Violent Raviente. Since the monster is still unclassified, it's not really considered to fall under any proper subspecies s classification. That being said, you could think of it as a sort of variant. The colour scheme of the monster has changed, with green and ivory white taking over the predominantly orange and brown. It also comes equipped with new abilities as well, such as the new flame breath attack that can heat up areas of the map to the point that they cause damage. It can also blind the player's vision by creating smoke around the map and will use this as an opportunity to try and inhale or attack hunters. This change from your typical Raviente to its violent alternative is said to be due to starvation, making the monster more aggressive and ready to prey on whatever is in its path. Moving on is a unique flying wyvern similar in design to a Rathian, with a dark black and bright red colour scheme. I'm the world's ultimate life form. 
similar to Devil Joe. Unknown, Black Flying Wyvern, would invade players' hunts and come equipped with a slew of cool features, including multiple rage states. In its first phase, the monster will simply huff black smoke whilst attacking the player, but soon after will begin spouting blue and yellow flames. Finally, in its final state, Unknown's eyes will turn a bright red and the membrane on its wings will begin to have a red flame-like pattern displayed. As the monster gets angrier and transitions through these states, it will get both faster and stronger. It seems to have the ability to create both large spheres and beams of fire, and can throw the claws on its wings at hunters as projectiles, which will then regenerate. Truly, the ultimate life form. New hardcore monsters include hardcore breeding season Hypnocatrice, which comes with more vibrant feathers and a more aggressive demeanor. Two of the feathers creating its crest seem to be enlarged. It's incredibly erratic and now has the ability to KO hunters by releasing a pink gas underneath it. Hardcore Camu and Nono Orgarin. Camu and Nono hit the gym and came back with increased muscle mass as well as various changes to facial features, such as their blue eyes, a typical change in some of the hardcore releases. They're faster and stronger than before, and their wind attacks are now considered Dragon Wind Strength. Post SR100, these monsters can enter a super rage state when their partner is slayed, making them even faster and stronger than their upgrades had already made them. These new rage states also unlock additional attacks for each. Hardcore Kushala Daora, which sports a brighter, almost white body, similar to when it sheds in the Monster Hunter Dose cutscenes. It can now inflict defense down, and can create ice crystals along the ground when roaring, which will not inflict any ailments, but will prevent the hunter from healing their red bar health over time. Hardcore Pink Rathian, with larger spikes and a purple hue on parts of its body, as well as odd symbols and designs on the membrane of its wings. It gets access to new moves and alternatives to existing ones, such as its tail swing now functioning as a sweeping motion behind it that can poison multiple people. Finally, if Hardcore Kezu wasn't enough for you, the developers of Frontier found it fitting to have the Red Kezu subspecies receive the same upgrade. It can now shoot thunderballs in all surrounding directions and drool acid, which can inflict the defense down ailment. Now, one of the biggest and arguably most successful features introduced in Frontier within the Forward 1.5 update was the inclusion of the Guku pet that can now be acquired. Think of it as a poogie, but instead of a pig, it was a miniature duck companion, which would gather bugs and catch fish for you while out on missions. They also had a special cooking pot minigame that allowed players to melt specific items into hardcore carves. If the player failed the minigame, their Guku would get the iconic burnt afro hairstyle that you might have seen circulating around the internet. The Guku were obtained by taking part in special duck hunting quests, in which the player would have to steal an egg from a monster and escape with it. Examples would be taking an egg from a Kongalala's tail by breaking it, or from a Tigrex's mouth by forcing it to charge into a wall. Similar to a Tamagotchi, you had to take care of your Guku, otherwise they would become unhappy and may even leave. And similar to a Pokemon, these pets had random natures which would affect what they gathered for you. If you think about how popular Poogie is within the mainline community, Gukus are equally idolized within Frontier. They quickly became the icon of the series thanks to their cute and customizable design. Now that was a lot to talk about for just one update, so let's now head over to Forward 2 and see what was added. The flagship of the Forward 2 update released June 29, 2011 was Gogomoa, a brand new fang beast and a rather popular addition due to its multiple unique mechanics. It's similar to a primate and will carry its child, a Kokomoa, on its back. Hunters can actually knock the Kokomoa off to send Gogo here into a blind rage. When in this state, Gogo will become both faster and stronger, but it will also take extra damage when attacked. On top of having the attributes of a primate, it also has the abilities of a spider, having the ability to produce a silk-like substance from its palms that it can use to swing around the map. Finally, if Gogo launched itself at hunters from its webbing, players could perform a type of counter-attack. If attacked during this animation, players would gain iframes and dodge the attack, while also dealing extra damage to the monster. Gogo was the set to work towards as an entry-level player at the time, due to the inclusion of the Evasion Plus 2 skill in its armor set, an ability that became more and more crucial to Frontier as the game progressed in updates and difficulty. Development-wise, Teruki Miyashita became producer of the Frontier series within this point of the game, and was a considerable factor in the design decisions going forward from this point. This is kind of hilariously important for series quests, which were also introduced. Similar to Monster Hunter Portable 3rd, certain quests, when completed, would immediately throw the hunter into another quest,
quest, but these could range from hunts to gathering slash harvest quests. Now, I promise I'm not making this up, but one of these special series quests led to a fight against a purple Gogomoa who not only wielded a gun lance, but also had the face of this new producer. That's right. The Tide Island also marked its appearance in Forward 2, which was a new hunting area the players could hunt monsters like Gogomoa in. Part of the area would change depending on whether or not it was the day or night and the level of the tide. A form of flash bug that was poisonous also inhabited the island and would become aggressive towards hunters if they hit the trees that housed their nests. Luckily, they could also aggro onto monsters, allowing the ability to poison them during combat. Hardcore monsters also came with a new mechanic in this iteration. A ticket system was put in place that allowed players to unlock special hidden armor sets. These sets, when worn together, would produce a set bonus that was dependent on the weapon the hunter was currently using. Generally, this would be a damage multiplier, but some were fairly unique, such as the longsword halving spirit gauge consumption, or the greatsword getting an increase to the level 4 charge timeframe. Hardcore Akantor was one of these new monster additions, and had an unusual blue tint to its hide in comparison to the typical red that we normally see, as well as a length increase to its tusks. It can now summon giant lava pillars and use its roar to damage hunters that are close to it. Next up was Hardcore Black Diablos, which have the blue eyes you see in multiple other HC monsters, as well as a gigantic left horn. She can create high level quakes similar to other hardcore monsters, and uses this as an opportunity to perform her digging attack, which is now much faster. Hardcore Blue Yan Kutku, who has an incredibly large lower jaw, which you can now use to lay pitfall traps for hunters to fall into. It's also much faster in the air compared with a traditional Yan Kutku. Hardcore Bulldrome, who appears older with larger, more developed tusks and a sick mohawk. It can toss chunks of the ground at hunters, but really it's still just a Bulldrome. Nothing too crazy about it. Hardcore Doragyurosu, with large claws at the end of its tendrils, yellow webbing, and golden eyes. It takes moves from the original Berekyurosu and is overall more agile. Around this time, a rare version of Dora was also released known as Phantom Doragyorosu, which essentially looked like the hardcore version, but it appears permanently in its rage state. The big thing about this monster is that it revives after death with a large explosion of the dragon element, and will enter a new tier of rage, becoming stronger and faster in the process. With an upgraded moveset, it was incredibly rare to engage with, and offered items that were only used as a trophy of your accomplishment. The final hardcore addition in Forward 2 is Hardcore Gravios, which has larger, more developed spikes and muscles. The speed of its sweeping beam maneuver has been improved, and it can be incredibly dangerous if the hunter isn't ready to dodge it. With all the hardcore monsters covered, it's time to move on to Forward 3. February 1st, 2012 marked the release of Forward 3 and two new monsters, but other than that, there weren't many new features to discuss. First is a brand new brute wyver known as Abirugu, a fire element monster that could perform sweeping beams and charged short range explosions. It was also a monster to have a double spinning tail move under its arsenal, but what made it special was that it would somehow ignore the invulnerability effect that's typically on hunters when sent flying due to damage, meaning they'd still be vulnerable for extra damage. This idea of ignoring iframes would become a regular occurrence in later monster editions within the Frontier series, and hunters would have to watch out for this in order to prevent quickly carding. Next up is Tycoon Zamaza, a brand new Carapacean entry. This was another monster that could be found on Tide Island from Forward 2 and took the appearance of a giant crab with a hammer and a scythe for either claw. Its body was covered in a dense coating of dirt which hunters could break off by attacking individual parts of the body. Once enough dirt was broken, Zamaza would smash the floor of the cave, leading the hunter down to a second level. From here, you continued the fight, attempting to remove more dirt from its bright orange shell. Once this had been achieved, the ground would be smashed a second time, leading to the final phase. It was at this last stand that the electric blue inner shell of Zamaza was revealed, and it could now utilize thunder attacks. This was very difficult to achieve, as you could very easily kill the monster before even progressing past the first area. One new inclusion was bringing over certain items and abilities from the mainline games, such as throwing knives. Now players have the ability to use these items within Frontier. Unfortunately, there were no new hardcore monster inclusions within this update, so we can move straight on to Forward 4.
Forward 4 released May 23, 2012. Similar to how Forward 3 bought a new Brute Wyvern, Forward 4 introduced a new Leviathan to the MMO, known as Kuaru Sepasu, who was found on the highland where we first fought Gurenziburu. Its main ability was found on the crystals that covered its body. Kuaru had the ability to amplify sunlight and lightning to stun and shock the hunter, as well as scatter the crystals to create dangerous landmines. One quest involved hunting a pair in the desert, who were able to conduct team attacks, proving a deadly combination. Speaking of, one of two new hardcore monsters introduced was Gurenziburu also, with a longer horn and longer spikes over its wings and tail. It has a new AoE attack where it smashes its horn into the ground and a new charge that can inflict stun. In higher ranks, it can also add water element to its normal attacks. Secondly, hardcore rusted Kushala looks even more rusted than the typical variant. Its main feature is a stronger roar, which required high grade earplugs to block. Now here's the really interesting thing about Forward 4. First of all, supremacy monsters get introduced in Forward 5, but not before hunters got a taste of what they would be like with a special invasion event featuring Unknown. It could hijack quests hunters were currently taking part in. Now Unknown most likely had a hardcore release at this point, gaining stronger tiers of wind pressure and additional small changes, but the supremacy species was where it was at. Here's a brief explanation of the supremacy species. Difficult. Grueling difficult was the design choice for these monsters. They're designed to be as punishing as possible and would really challenge seasoned hunters that wanted to even attempt them. They would have two versions of their hunts. The first was like an introduction to their battle, where if it wasn't completed in time, the monster would essentially be repelled, except this repel was considered a failed state. The second version was a shortened 20 minute hunt. Let's take a look at supremacy unknown now, since it was technically introduced in season four. It acts similarly at first to your typical unknown, and will still transition through multiple rage states, with six in total. It borrows moves from monsters like the Espinaz subspecies, but upgraded to be even more challenging. Take the charged fireball move as an example. It will shoot a large fireball into the air that will split into multiple small balls that fall to the ground. However, these projectiles will actually home in on hunters unless they stick close to the monster. In its sixth rage mode, a blue aura will surround it, and it has a combo maneuver where it can launch players into the air by stomping and crushing the ground around it. After this, it roars that causes chaos status. Another example is when it lifts off of the ground, producing wind with enough force that it can kill, then diving down and attacking its targets multiple times, ignoring recovery iframes. Getting hit by this combination is guaranteed instant death. While this monster typically invades quests, the supremacy version would later be selectable as a postable hunt of its own. Okay, so we have our first taste of supremacy monsters, but as mentioned, they weren't fully introduced until the next update. Let's move on to forward 5 and see what's in store for us. Forward 5 released February 6th, 2013, and it would be the final forward update until the release of the G series. It brought with it a new flagship, 4 new hardcore monsters, and 6 new supremacy species. Odiba Tarasu is the new flagship and an enormous flying wyvern, despite not actually having the ability to fly, that inhabited the desert. Seen as a distant relative of a Cantor and Eucanalos, it attacked with its huge size and massive roars, being able to send out waves of sand and crush hunters with its body weight. It also sported an enormous, if I'm reading this right, cannon on the back of its turtle-like shell that was able to fire sand and rock in huge chunks to harm the hunters. Most notable was the roar it used when going into rage mode, as it could quite easily one-shot hunters who weren't prepared. Both the hardcore and supremacy species of this monster were introduced in Forward 5, which is rare to see from a brand new edition. The hardcore variation is fairly similar, with the horns having more of an orange tinge in comparison to the white of the normal version, and it has a stronger roar requiring super high-grade earplugs. Supremacy OD, while more powerful, didn't offer much in terms of changes to the actual battle. Now for the remaining hardcore monsters, we have hardcore Beru Kirorosu and Gogomoa. Beru has two large spikes coming out of each talon now, and has the ability to use moves normally that used to only be available while it was in its rage state. Past SR100, hardcore Beru can even fly into the sky and shoot a large red beam downward before having it travel horizontally across the map. The beam is incredibly large and even bigger than the monster itself. Hardcore Gogomoa now has red claws as well as the ability to throw coconuts into trees, which will explode on contact, acting as a grenade with the shrapnel spreading outward. If hit, this attack can cause both poison and sleep status ailments. It's more agile and can pull branches down from the trees using its webbing, which can hit hunters, and it has the ability to swing circularly around the map. 
On to the remaining and incredibly powerful supremacy species. We have a pairing known as Aruganosu and Goruganosu. You can think of these as silver and gold Lavasioths. Aru is an ice elemental monster that has the ability to inflict paralysis, while Goru is a thunder element monster and can inflict sleep. You'll fight these Piscean wyverns together, but killing them may be tricky. Once one is on its last HP, it will simply flop around like a fish out of water and you won't be able to finish it off until you get the partner down to the same state. Take too long, and the disabled fish will begin to heal the other, so you need to be efficient in hunting these two. On top of all of this, they also had the ability to perform team attacks, which could be devastating to an unwary hunter. Supremacy Dora Girosu is one of the more difficult monsters to receive the supremacy treatment, as if simply being this variational monster wasn't bad enough. Aside from various physical changes, it pulls moves and abilities from other forms of Dora Girosu and Beru Girosu and new attacks entirely such as lifting and launching chunks of the ground into the air before large projectiles begin to fall within a wide area. The coolest thing about it is what happens upon death. Similar to Phantom Dora, the Supremacy version will revive after death, starting with a large explosion of Dragon Element. It then enters a permanent rage state and is buffed with increased speed, attack range, and new abilities, making it incredibly deadly. Now, Supremacy Pariapuria was another fearsome addition. Its appearance has actually been greatly changed changed with its body covered in blood, mainly on its claws and fangs. This monster could do almost anything. On top of being stronger and incredibly fast, it could also mix its vomit into its projectiles to cause KO and soiled at the same time, or coat itself, allowing it to inflict poison, paralysis, or sleep when colliding with a hunter. It has many, many new attacks that I won't go over here, but it was truly ferocious. Finally, we have Supremacy Tiastra, who was also considered to be one of the more grueling hunts in the game at the time. Truly considered an irredeemable bastard among the frontier community for how ludicrously powerful it was. Similar to Hardcore Tiastra, it has better control over the fire element and therefore has more powerful, faster, wider, and controlled abilities. It basically functioned in two modes, one where it acted like your typical hardcore Tiastra and an enhanced form. In this form, it'll create a giant flame tornado, jump into it, and let out a horrible screech, coming out looking like a Californian gender reveal party. Again, it has multiple new moves, and I wouldn't want to simply list them all here, but hopefully this footage gives you a good idea of what this horrible experience might have felt like. So, are you terrified yet? Supremacy was only a taste of what began to show up in G, and maybe the start of one of the big reasons Western fans don't like the idea of playing Frontier. They were incredibly difficult fights, and a hyper-reliance on the evasion skill was beginning to form around these design choices. It'll be interesting to see how this evolved within G and Z moving forward, but unfortunately, that's all I have for you today. The next part of this history series will cover the G1 to G5 updates and what they brought to the table. I'd like to give a big shout out and thanks to Sarah Symmetry for helping out with the script and research as well as appearing in the video itself. Again, all of their links can be found below so be sure to check their content out. Additionally, thanks to Fist from Fist.moe and all of the community members for helping clarify certain aspects of the game. Thanks to Ascalon for helping explain features about specific updates and thanks to Kapu and Eric for providing the in-game footage. In my previous video, we talked a lot about the features and monsters included in Forward, but one big feature I didn't mention was the inclusion of Hulks, which were companion flying wyverns introduced in Forward 2. I'd like to take a little bit of time now to go over them since I missed them previously. They were customizable companions similar to Palicos. Players could equip skills to them in order to produce various types of effects, such as their Hulk being able to shoot various elemental projectiles, or even giving the ability to heal or buff hunters. Their element was dictated based on what hunters fed them, and this could be changed recurrently. The element they set would change the appearance of the Hulk, and each element had three different levels which would also adjust the appearance. An update within Forward 4 allowed Hulks to act similarly to a Farcaster and transport hunters to any area within the map. However, the trade-off was that this traversal method would land you in a random location.
Frontier G was announced as a massive update or expansion for Monster Hunter Frontier Online and would start things off with 10 brand new monsters as well as upgrades for various other monsters thanks to the inclusion of G-Rank finally being implemented. This meant there would be new G-Rank weapons and armor sets as well as the introduction of new elements and actions for various weapon types currently included within the game. Its initial release was April 17th, 2013. Now while the game announced 10 new monsters for G1, a few of these had to be pushed back due to development issues. Thanks to this, there was actually only 5 brand new monsters released in G1 and we wouldn't see more until G2. Along with these new monster inclusions came 3 new areas to fight in, explore, or both. We'll be going over all of them as we discuss the new monsters inclusions. Similar to Lidroth and Royal Lidroth introduced in Monster Hunter Tri, Frontier introduced a new small and large leviathan pairing with the inclusion of Pokara and Pokara Dawn. Both were walrus-like creatures, with the Pokara having slight visual differences between male and female. Much like hardcore Blue Yan Kukku, it was able to also make pitfall traps for hunters to fall into, and also attacked using concussive claps. These monsters could be found in the new hunting area known as Polar Sea, which mostly consisted of icy cliffsides and glaciers, as well as flat floating ice that the player can traverse. Players can actually find a frozen Lao Shan Lung in one of the glaciers found within Area 4 on this map. Farinoku is a stylish bird wyvern that takes design influence from both Gypsaros and Hypnocatrice. It uses its funky little afro to store static electricity and will dance around and discharge this periodically. This monster tends to be found within the Great Forest and Desert locations. Midogarin is a fanged beast that happens to be an odd mutation of a lone Kamu or a Garen. It has gained the ability to manipulate fire, and it can move so fast that it'll disappear for a moment and hunters will have to listen for an audio cue to know when to dodge. A tad bit more fair than the instant transmission hardcore Kirin. Hyujikiki is a flying wyvern that resides in the highlands. Like Narkakuga, it mainly attacks by throwing out spines to stick into the ground, but its movement is more based off of Baryoth from Monster Hunter Tribe. In fact, you'll probably notice that a lot of monsters introduced at this point used 3rd gen ranks. The main thing that Hyuji has is in its final phase, where upon taking enough damage, a storm would begin in the highlands and Hyuji would summon a whirlwind around its tail. From here, it gains the ability to imbue its spikes with not only paralysis, but sleep and poison at the same time, and it was entirely possible to juggle those effects on unsuspecting hunters. You could be paralyzed while poisoned, then a follow-up attack would render you sound asleep, truly a very dangerous Edition. Now for the flagship monster, Shantian, which functioned as your G-Rank entry point and had to be defeated in order to access G-Rank content. It's an Elder Dragon and fought in a special new airship location known as the Large Exploration Ship. This area functions as your typical arena battleground for fighting Elder Dragons and contains multiple tools like Ballista and Hunting Gong. Shantian's movement resembles that of 3rd gen Leviathans and is a shortened quest for the G-Break or G-Entry Point. Shantian will start on the floor of the exploration ship and use a plethora of thunder attacks. Upon taking enough damage, it begins to float, where it acts much like an underwater Lagaya cruise using the same thunder elements. Deal enough damage from here and the clouds will darken, lightning will strike, and Shantian will fly around a great distance from the ship. Players must then utilize the ship's ballista binder to bring it crashing back down. However, this fight will end in a rappel and be revisited later on in G2 for the full experience. Once repelled, players will finally have successfully entered G-Rank. One final note on Shantian is that it introduced the Tensho element, which was one of many new combination elements that would consist of two or three at varying degrees of effectiveness. For example, Tensho consisted of fire, water, and thunder elements, but dealt more with water than the other two. Further elemental combinations were introduced in later updates, but the light element, which consisted of thunder and fire, actually showed up in G1 through premium event weapons in a fate stain night collaboration. The G1 update saw an initial surge in sales and players for Frontier, but ultimately this began to get worse and worse with a 20-30% to drop in player base, and the development team feeling a sense of crisis during this time. Despite this, updates would continue, and as a lot of us know, the game would survive all the way to 2019. On May 22nd, Frontier received a G1 Refine update, which fixed several bugs within the game and continued the inclusion of the Hunter Festival and the inclusion of G Rank Secret Armor, which I described in the previous video, so go check it out over there. Seriously, I can't stress enough how buggy this game was for a little while there. The developers really weren't expecting such a surge in players with the release of G, and it unfortunately showed. Now, with all that out of the way, let's check out the new inclusions in Monster Hunter Frontier G2.
G2 released July 10th, 2013, introducing the five remaining monsters that were supposed to be released for G1, as well as two other monsters planned for a G4 release, but that had released early. A new Conquest War mechanic was introduced, which we'll get into, and this was also the point we started seeing announcements and releases of Frontier on additional consoles. Conquest War was a new weekly event introduced to the series, which consisted of two week phases. This was necessary to fight the full versions of Shantian, the newly introduced Disu Fiora, G Rank Fatalis, who was released in G3.1, and G Rank Crimson Fatalis, who was released later. The second week was the rewards phase where players could collect various rewards based on how they performed in the war. Similar to guild quests in Monster Hunter 4, killing conquest monsters would raise their level. Slaying a monster without carding raises its level by 5, while carding will lower this level gain by 2 per feint. Luckily, you fainting would not affect the progress of others. Levels reset at the start of the event and have a cap all the way up to 9999, which may seem excessive, but was doable. Leveling a hunt raises the monster's attack and defense by a multiplier. Certain level thresholds would even change their mechanics. For example, G rank Fatalis would gain Dark Revival, which would allow it to pull a Vantum or Supremacy Deru move and revive in Rage Mode while being even more powerful. Leveling could be done faster by participating in special story quests per event monster. Getting to a certain point within these quests unlocked the Songstress, and players could raise her friendship level in order to boost how many levels they received. This conquest event allowed players to fully hunt and slay Shantian, and during the fight, there would be a transition in which the exploration ship crashes into a volcanic area. Think of it like fighting Gen Moran, which transitions to a final confrontation midway through the fight. Now, Shantian wasn't the only enemy that received this treatment. The dragon Disu Fiora was introduced. This white and red elder dragon bore a resemblance to Alatreon in stature and movement, but with a level of power and insanity that was starting to be expected from Frontier. It utilized the combo element Frozen Seraphim, which combined fire, ice, and dragon. Massive meteor storms, combined ice and fire blasts, a second phase that allowed it to cause huge ice explosions from the ground, summon massive tornadoes of ice and fire, and a massive attack that would one-shot hunters unless they stood behind the shield that Disu constructed for itself, very similar to some of the mechanics we now see in World. This monster could be fought at the new World's End Arena location. Moving away from the craziness that was Disu, regular monsters introduced also included Anoru Patisu, a flying wyvern modeled off of a saw-nosed shark. This aggressive flying wyvern ruled the polar sea and had the ability to tunnel in and out of the thick ice whilst using the ice element with deadly effectiveness. Despite sharing a lot of movement with the 3rd gen Diablos rig, it was a surprisingly adept flyer, and had an interesting feature once you massively reduced its health, where it would begin to use the dragon element and would create tornadoes with combinations of the two elements. Gyaorugu was also introduced. It was a relative of a Biorugu, but utilizes the ice element rather than the fire element. It could form massive structures of ice for the sole purpose of shattering it to strike hunters, and also had the ability to roll, much like Uragon. Next up we have Rebidiora, who is a subspecies of Rukodiora, and could use the new Thunder Pole element which combined thunder and magnetism together. Rebidiora was slower than Rukodiora, however hit much harder and featured roaming thunderballs that would explode at inopportune times. Continuing the magnetism trend, another duo monster pair were introduced known as Ray and Lolo Gogarf. These monsters shared a stance with Rajang and had the ability to perform tag team attacks using mild amounts of magnetism. One interesting thing to note is that these two could damage each other significantly during their individual attacks, and if one was to be stunned, the knockout stars would persist even after they woke up. In this state, they would often target their mate. Additionally, these monsters were originally planned for G4, which was still two updates away, but were pushed forward for an earlier release. These monsters were also the first to reintroduce hardcore into the G updates, each coming with a hardcore version that dealt additional damage and would allow them to puff up their fur larger when enraged. Finally, we have Miru, who was accessed through a rare quest. A counterpart to the unknown flying wyvern we met in the last video, Miru was a shape-shifting fox pseudo-wyvern that would jump through different states as it took damage. It uses attacks from Tigrex, Nargakuga, and Diura, and has the ability to use the Crystal Blight we had only seen on the Akura family up until now, as well as the Fire Element. These states it could shift into would cause various visual differences. The different modes consisted of its base form where it didn't use any elements, 
Essence, a crystal form where it was whiter and used crystal attacks, a fire form where it had blue curved horns, a speed form where it was similar to Nargakuga, and a power form where red markings would cover it. As it neared death, it was able to eventually combine these forms into a huge red, white, and dangerous all over form. Sarah Symmetry pointed out to me that the fight theme for this monster is absolutely amazing. In August, the PS3 and Wii U ports of Frontier were announced, with the PS3 version being released on November 20th, 2013, and the Wii U version being released on December 11th. In September, the Vita was also announced to start Frontier service in 2014. These ports all allowed crossplay within the same server, meaning PS3, Wii U, and Vita players could play alongside PC players. And it's kind of crazy that an essentially heavily modded Monster Hunter Dose release did this while World never bothered. G3 was released October 16th, 2013 with a G3.1 update on December 18th and a G3.2 update on February 5th, 2014. Not only did this expansion bring several new monsters and a large amount of hardcore species, but it also introduced the new sigil system, hunting partners, and burst species. Certain G rank weapons would have slots associated with them, but these were different from traditional decoration slots. Instead, they were diamond shaped and players would slot in special sigils. These sigils had various effects, such as simply raising raw damage a lot, they could raise it a lot, or even granting new weapon moves, as well as various other effects. Seriously, this was the closest Frontier players could get to reaching Godhood by this point in the series, and could become exceptionally powerful with the help of sigils. Once fused to a weapon, sigils required a special catalyst to remove, which would be obtained through various means. Hunting partners were similar to the Rasta system already implemented, except players had the ability to actually bring their partner on quests with them rather than giving them to other hunters. They could level up through use and would have their own weapon rank and skill set. Some of the skills they could obtain were useful endgame abilities, but unfortunately the weapon choice was limited based on effectiveness. For example, while a sword and shield partner may be fairly effective in battle, having them equip other weapons could tend to be useless and do more harm than good, most likely due to how the AI was programmed. Baru Rigaru was introduced and this monster presented a hugely adaptable fight and several quests for it were introduced. Baru was a leech-like leviathan that had the ability to pin hunters and drain their blood. This extended to the native life in the biome it was fought in. Baru was seen with seams on its flank and when it gorged itself the seams was split to show the fluids it had consumed. It could drain poison, blood, and paralyzing venom and the seam would show each fluid the beast had absorbed. For example, it could snare a gendrome and gain the paralysis ability. Baru could also exhaust its reserve of drained fluid if interrupted enough whilst feeding, at which point it would default to its base element which was surprisingly water. This monster also had a hardcore variation that was stronger than its normal counterpart. Next up we have the burst species, which are considered to be powerful relatives of existing monsters that can utilize various elements. The first to be introduced in G3 was Zeru Rezu, a relative of Rathalos who utilized the new light element, a combination of thunder and fire. The unique thing about Zeru here is is that it would change itself based on the damage that the hunter was doing and in turn boost its own attacks in turn. With cutting weapons, Zero boosted its legs with massive stomps faster movement, and a resistance to cutting damage. With blunt, it boosted its face spikes and allowed it to gain resistance to blunt damage. With shots, it would mimic its assailant and use more ranged light attacks. In G3.2, another burst species was introduced, known as Muraginasu, who is a relative of the Espina species. As this monster was adapted to the darkness, its gimmick was being completely blind. It utilizes the darkness element which combines ice and dragon and targets players based on who is performing the most damage or who is making the most noise. It will then hyper focus on said target similar to Safi Jiva in Monster Hunter World. While relative to Espinus, the visual differences are striking, with a black and bright yellow color scheme as well as a large drill-like horn. Another interesting mechanic was that this monster's aggro was so intense, hunters were presented with three bone piles the moment Mirag Ganasu got mad. These bone piles completely eliminated all damage and knockback for attacks, up to three times, and were instrumental in managing the monster's ire. Other hardcore monsters include hardcore Akura Vishimu, who can produce multiple crystals that will explode over time, but also has the ability to run into them and set them off early. It also has a hip check that's so powerful it will actually knock itself over due to the force. Hardcore Black Gravios, who appears as an older version of your typical subspecies. Black Gravios will vent heat far more often than traditionally expected and can emit hot sleep gas from its tail attacks. 
Hardcore Cephedrome, who now has a pink hue along the edge of its fins. The main difference with this hardcore monster is how aggressive it is compared to a typical Cephedrome. On top of this, it can now command the Cephalos around it for coordinated attacks. Sounds similar to what we are seeing with Great Izuki in Monster Hunter Rise. And Hardcore Gold Rathian. Other than being stronger, it had a few visual differences like a large, longer chin, and blue eyes. A few new moves included a side tail swing which is thrown out in a counterclockwise motion, a large forward rush attack, and a charged breath attack. It's finally time to talk about G4, or as it is known at release, G Genuine, and the introduction of a brand new weapon, the Tonfas. Monster Hunter Frontier G Genuine released April 23rd, 2014 and came with arguably one of the biggest inclusions of the entire series, the Tonfa class. Tonfas were an extremely unique addition and came with multiple new features to help them stand out from the traditional weapons that had already been implemented. Functioning as an impact weapon, Tonfas had two modes, short and long, and these forms would reverse the hit zone values. For example, if a monster was weak to blunt on its chest and head, you'd use the long form, but if you were in a predicament where you could only focus on the tail or legs, switching to short would allow you to be equally as effective. Tonfas really required you to understand monsters on a meta level. Consider that Miru's different forms would shift its hitbox values, meaning that you had to know exactly which form to use for whichever specific area you were focusing on and be ready to switch when Miru shifted. At the time, Tonfas were the only weapons that allowed the players to sprint while they were readied and could be considered one of the most overlooked contributions to the series, as it would allow you to keep up with rampaging monsters. Players could attack areas on a monster and build up Dragon Spirit on them, ranging from a green aura to orange and finally red. The energy could then be released into a damaging explosion that would also apply a buff depending on the area of the monster that was affected. It was the definitive and only aerial weapon as using its vault mechanic actually offered iframes and hunters could evade in midair. Finally, the weapon also had a combo bar that when filled offered an attack buff multiplier, but the weapon only had access to the earth style on its release. Now, if you watched my previous video on all of the Linnean creatures within the series, you'll remember that the flower field area is full of a Ruki, a friendly Linnean species that will often aid the hunter in battle. Flowerfield was a wide open and beautiful area that the player would hunt various monsters in, including the new Fowrau Karuru. The Flowerfield's apex Fowrau Karuru was modeled after a hummingbird. By absorbing the nectar of the plants around the area, Fowrau Karuru gained the different elements and ailments. It could take on sleep, poison, paralysis, defense down, fire, and an interesting new ailment called dark, whereby the hunter's screen would be obscured by black blots, making it difficult to see. It also had a new hardcore class where it could utilize the nectar or honey as a projectile. Diorex was another burst species introduced as a relative of Tigrex. It revolved around charging up certain body parts to attack. For instance, it would charge up with an effect around its legs and do a massive jumping combo. The secret to this fight was that it was incredibly weak to impact damage, as the devs had devised it to be the perfect punching bag for Tonfas. On top of this, it featured negative element hit zones. Your overall damage was punished for using any element that wasn't dragon or ice. When Diorex didn't have any parts broken, using fire and thunder had a flat negative 20 on all hit zones and water had negative 10, so your damage would be compromised if you chose any of these elements. Seems similar to how players are now punished for not being properly elementally prepared to fight Alitreon in World. Additionally, hardcore monsters include hardcore Akira Jebia, who now has the ability to shoot crystals into the air before shooting at them so that they come crashing down and covering a wide area. It can also scatter crystals behind itself with its tail. And hardcore Silver Rathalos, who is now covered in larger spikes all around its body. It can now rapidly fire its fireballs and can charge up a slow explosive fire ball as well. On top of the new weapons and monsters, G Genuine also brought along the high-grade graphical update, updating the majority of textures and visual effects in the game to be more up to standard with previous mainline releases and the general trend of graphics at this point in time. It also brought with it the Hunter Navi, which was the set of tasks and chores players could complete to become better acquainted with all of the functions and systems in the game and offered these tasks from the start of HR1 all the way to the end of G, making it incredibly helpful. One final notable mechanic was the introduction of a limited use skill that could one shot some monsters. The skill had a limited use and could only really be performed something like once every three days. Hunters could charge their knife and then send it crashing into the ground creating an earthquake effect. 
The damage was based on how many weapons the player had maxed the style rank on. We're now going to move on to the final section of this video, G5, where we'll take a look at all of the new monster inclusions as well as the part mirror system. G5 released July 23rd, 2014. The major inclusion in this update was the introduction of the Partner system. Similar to hunting partners or palicos from mainline games, players could finally bring felines along with them on hunts. Like Freedom Unite, players could have up to four cats and set them up with individual classes like bomber cats who would use explosives. Partners had the chance of obtaining hardcore or rare materials for you and could obtain rare gathering materials as well. In terms of helpful NPCs, Frontier really was king providing you with so many options of assistance to bring with you on missions, and the level of customizability for each is something we still haven't really seen in mainline games. Moving on to monsters, we have multiple new hardcore species, a new burst species, Elder Dragon, and a new original Elder Dragon. First up we have Inagami, who is a sleep-wielding elder present in the Bamboo Forest map, another new arena area introduced in G5. Inagami was unique for two reasons, one being its self-restorative abilities, and the second being the use of the map. Inagami here would use massive bamboo poles to extend its melee range, and sprout shoots from the ground to further extend it. Inagami also had additional mechanics whereby damaging each limb would script a stagger. If you damaged the two front and back legs, the tail, and the head, Inagami would be scripted into coating itself with a healing substance, and once all of the above limbs were coated, it would perform a sleep AoE whereby afterwards it could topple itself. If you iframe this, it would present a massive opportunity. Next up is Garuba Deora, a burst species of Kushala. Garuba was yet another new monster that used the awful crystal blight from Akura, but that wasn't all. Garuba had an area-wide one-shot that ignored guts or anything defensive and would start the fight with this. The only way to avoid this was to get close to Garuba and stand inside a protective sphere that the monster would generate. This was a real problem since Garuba would do a swipe at the start and potentially knock away hunters. Additional hardcore monsters included Hardcore Espinus Rare Species, who, I mean, just look at him. He's crazy looking. It's a darker variant of the typical white Espinus, and the spines are even larger than before. On top of that, it seems to glow a purple hue around its wings and head area. It can breathe a poison mist now and can form toxic puddles and tornadoes. And finally, Hardcore Purple Gypsaros, who is much faster and more aggressive. It can fly in the air and immediately slam down and then immediately flash afterward to really catch hunters off guard. It can also shoot out a trio of poison balls in a triangular formation. Visually, the talons and claws are longer, as well as the teeth. Here we are at the end again, and I want to thank all of you for making it here. The G series of Frontier is bursting at the seams with content, and I wasn't able to realistically cover everything within this video. However, I believe I covered the major key points and factors in order to give you a good idea of what these entries in the Frontier series were like. The next part in this history series will cover the remaining 5G updates. I'd like to give a big shout out and thanks to Sarah Symmetry and Ascalon for helping out with the script and research. Additionally, thanks to Fist from Fist.moe and all the community members for helping clarify certain aspects of the game. And thanks to Kapu and Eric for providing the in-game footage when possible. Monster Hunter Frontier G was released November 18th, 2014, with a 6.1 update on February 15th, 2015. To make a small correction on the previous video, I want to point out that I stated the High Grade Edition was released with G Genuine, however this seems to be incorrect. Rather, G6 fully implemented High Grade, while there was a G6 Experience event during G5 that allowed players to test it out beforehand. This is a little confusing for me, so if there's an error here, I apologize. Anyway, the the biggest feature of G6 outside of the new monster editions had to be the Sky Corridor, which is a huge tower created by the ancient civilization. To preface this, I'm going to be mentioning a couple key features and designs that might seem like they have an implication of Monster Hunter's lore in regards to the ancient civilization. 
If you've seen my video on Equal Dragon Weapon, you know we do not have a lot of valid information on Monster Hunter lore when it comes to things outside of the games themselves. And I want to make it clear that you shouldn't take some of the frontier features and designs and try to explain them in canon. None of this matters in canon, and none of this is going to fill your lore books or explain concepts like Equal Dragon Weapon because they currently don't exist. The Sky Corridor was a playable treasure hunt scenario where players would ascend through levels of this giant tower that was full of traps and secret rooms to be rewarded with custom weapons and armor. Apparently the names of these weapons were things like Virus, Demon Path, Enemy Within, and so on, and if you're scratching your head asking why the names sound so edgy, it's apparently due to the fact that they were the names of various metal bands. These tower weapons were fully customizable, and players could allocate stats to raise attack, elemental damage, select a status ailment, raise affinity, and raise the level of sharpness. Think of it as a Build-A-Bear workshop, but to kill things instead of cuddle them. The developers even offered a website with a template to allocate stats within, so players could plan out their build before committing to it. As of writing this, the Taiwan website is actually still up, although missing some content because Taiwan never got access to the Zenith updates. I'll link it in the description if you want to take a look. During development, the Sky Corridor was meant to implement an ancient civilization NPC, or at least her ghost, but this seems to have been scrapped early on. Regardless, there's some cool concepts to take note of here that relate to the concepts revolving towers and the ancient civilization, such as monsters acting as watchdogs on specific floors of the Sky Corridor, or the tower basically being compared to a warehouse, which is something we've heard in concepts for the Equal Dragon weapon. At the end of the run, players had the option to either escape the tower or fight Dure Mudira, who we will get into shortly. But one final thing to note, the corridor and resulting Dure Mudira fight were on a time limit. Rather than having a finite number of carts, players would simply receive a time penalty for each time they faint, eventually resulting in them running out of time entirely. So, Dure Mudira. This obsidian-colored elder dragon inhabited the higher levels of the Sky Corridor. It starts out with huge stomps, powerful ice attacks, and wide-reaching tackles before powering up after taking damage. With this, it added the new Corrupted Poison ailment, a powerful and quick-acting poison that also afflicted defense down. The poison couldn't be cured by antidotes, and players had to use a built-in perk system with Sky Corridor to give themselves a buff to deal with it. Dure was relentless, having an infamous combo where it would gallop across the map multiple times in quick succession, homing in on hunters. If you got caught, Dure would instantly combo you into a pounce attack and could very easily one-shot you. It has two phases, where in the second phase it will cover its claws in ice. Sarah Symmetry pointed out that Frontier showed an example of how monsters could cancel certain animations for combos. There are a lot of attacks where if you don't get hit by the first part, the second part simply won't happen. Think of it like Velcana's ice floor attack. If you get frozen, she'll stab you. If you don't, she does nothing. Dure's quest options are also incredibly interesting. You can cart as many times as you like, at which point you will fall to the ground as if you were stunned. You can lie here for one minute after which you'll respawn, or alternatively, press A to spawn automatically. Whilst you are lying prone, other players can throw the Revival Ball item onto you to nullify the feint. These feints could cost 1 minute long penalties on the timer, and the fight only lasted 20 minutes, so it was rarely an option to take the cart. That wasn't all however. There existed a second version of Dure known as Second District, that could keel over and die like the base species, however, you wouldn't be treated to any carves and the screen would slowly begin to fog and freeze over. At this point, the monster entered Phase 3 and changed dramatically in appearance and power. Poison icicles littered the battlefield and each slam could produce huge waves of venom. You had the same time limit, more health, and more power to deal with. It's no understatement that Dure Mudira was a massive wall to overcome. However, doing so would provide amazing sigil rewards for hunters to utilize. Next up we got Pobao Rubarumu, a giant whale-like monster residing in the highlands. Pobao was a hunting horn on legs, it had the ability to buff itself considerably with attack buffs, health buffs, and even defense buffs. At the start of every fight, Pobao would sing a song that causes all of these buffs to activate. In terms of fighting, it moved very similar to a cantor, using its huge frame and limbs to crush hunters, as well as being able to send out waves of sounds at hunters. If you were hit by this attack, a new ailment known as confusion would be applied, but this is not to be confused with the reverse controls of Mainline introduced in Cross. This status would randomly cause the player to dance. That's right, the dance gestures would randomly play, interrupting your combos and leaving you as a sitting duck. Hobao also introduced the Kanade element, which was a combination of water and ice. This monster has a hardcore mode introduced as well, but the differences are very subtle. 
G6.1 introduced a new burst species in the form of Varusaboros, who took the form of a demonic Diabolos coated in fire. It would attack by covering the arena in flames when enraged, darting behind hunters to skewer them with its horns, and bursting fire pillars from the ground. Interestingly, as this species evolved from Diablos moving to the desert to get their fix on a particular type of cactus, this actually factored into the fight as well. A single cactus ball could be carried around like a wyvern egg spawned whenever Verusa was out of rage, and hunters could roll this across the battlefield to prevent the monster from catching it. This would lock Verusa into its weaker state, and would provide an easy distraction for the other members of the party. Be warned though, if the Flamehorn Wyvern snatched up the cactus, the fire on its body would turn purple and it would stop at nothing to take you down. Other new hardcore monsters included hardcore Kuwaru Sapusu, who had an overall darker body with yellow accents littered around. It has a new combo mechanic where it can perform a rolling attack before cartwheeling and scattering crystals. It will then explode all of the crystals at once with a roar. And hardcore Lunastra, who looks even more ferocious. She has similar upgrades to hardcore Tiastra, such as a larger flamethrower. This upgrade is faster, stronger, and comes with new moves, such as a somersault into dust explosion combo, where it will perform a jumping somersault and blow up the area directly below. And that's finally it for G6. We can now move on to G7 and see the new additions such as monsters, styles for Tonfa, and the biggest inclusion, Transcendence. So G7 gets released April 15th, 2015, and with it a new feature known as Transcendence or Transcendental Secret, which was an ability that would be unlocked by hunters at HR3. Think of it like Y-Stones from 4 Ultimate, in that it was an item that would be consumed to put your hunter into a powered up state. The big difference, however, was that the Transcendental State would take time throughout the quest to power up. Transcendence could offer many buffs to be customized and upgraded by the hunter through the completion of cycling event quests that offer points. These points are then used to unlock and upgrade various buffs for the player. Players that entered the quest with Transcendence would see an icon in their item bar that would slowly change in color from silver to gold. Once gold, it would begin to flash and players that activated it would enter an advanced form where their buffs are applied and they may even have new on-hit animations depending on their element. Upon landing enough attacks, the players could then use a super move known as Elemental Burst, where they charge at the enemy with their hunting knife and unleash a large elemental attack. These still adhered to the rules of monster elemental weaknesses, resistances, or immunity. Meaning if the monster was immune to the element, the burst would instead be raw damage, and if it was a multi-element weapon, it would try to use the element that was most effective against the monster, or randomize the element if none of them were particularly effective. On to monsters, Haruto Merugu was announced. Dominating the Interceptor's base and polar regions alike, it was an Elder Dragon similar in stance to Kushala or Ruko Diora, and had the ability to control metal. A liquid metal substance coated this monster, functioning as armor and wings, and yes, a weapon. Puddles of metal would rain from the sky, and they could be sharpened into points and even thrown out like boomerangs. Interestingly, Haruto could also throw every last bit of metal at hunters, leaving it exposed to large damage if hunters could capitalize on on it. Its most feared attack was the ability to encase itself in a sphere of what looks like mercury and run rings around a hunter before slamming down. Connecting with any part of this attack was a one-shot, and it was an absolute nightmare to evade. This monster came with a hardcore counterpart right away, but the differences were extremely minimal. One big change was the fact that it seemed easier to kill, but had higher part break thresholds. Moving on is a new subclassification of monsters introduced into the MMO known as Origin Species. Origin monsters are existing monsters that inherit more from their ancestors, vastly changing both the visual look of their design as well as the abilities they had available to them. Origin monsters only lasted until G10, but brought with it four new total inclusions. The first of which was Gorea Dumas, a relative of Gravios that utilizes the water element to fire beams, and to propel itself at hunters. For something so huge and ungainly, it had a surprising amount of speed. The biggest visual differences is the orange shading around the body while being covered in large grassy green patches of moss and other flora. Other hardcore monsters included hardcore Gendrome and hardcore green Plesioth, that son of a bitch. Gendrome came with a few new additional techniques, including jumping while causing vibrations on the ground or placing paralysis mines, a new paralysis bullet attack where it follows a head bash by shooting paralysis projectiles, and finally paralysis breath. Green Plesioth can now use a sleep attack, dash attack, and multiple crawling motions around you. Its scales are a bit brighter now as well. 
One final note is that the Tonfa now also had access to the Heaven and Storm styles, allowing it to catch up in features compared to previously introduced weapons within the series. Alright, it looks like we can move on to G8, where we'll be focusing on new monsters and the return of old monsters through the new exotic species system. Let's take a look now. July 22nd, 2015 marked the release of G8, and with it a new flagship monster known as Gazura Bazura, another new member of the Brute Wyvern class. It had the ability to tunnel in and out of the sand and use powered blasts of poison. It could even target hunters with poison blobs after stunning them with a spin attack. The real party didn't start, however, until it hit rage mode, at which point it would glow a vivid purple and enlarge its already sizable palms into crushing machines. From here, it would abandon the poison status in favor of throwing everything but the kitchen sink at its foot. Huge boulders, sand waves, even exiting rage mode by raising a massive pillar and somersaulting off of it. Funnily enough, in its ecology, it was mentioned that Gazura was hiding in the sands from something, although hunters weren't quite sure what. Gazura also had a hardcore variation on release, but the changes were again very minimal. On top of this, it was mostly found in the new hunting location known as White Lake, which was a giant desert full of white sand that changed slightly based on if it was night or day. Yamakurai was also introduced, a massive origin species of Yamasukami that inhabited the highlands. Rather than the slow trawl through a tower, you fought this guy man to man with the core gameplay revolving around the thunderbugs. Kurai would throw these out at key points during the fight and if damaged, they would fly back and impact the monster itself. Do enough of these and you would force the beast to earth. In terms of abilities, it would use its massive size to charge, crush, and just batter around hunters, as well as having the peculiar ability of throwing seeds out onto the field to immediately sprout trees and wildlife, causing damage. Now, the exotic classification was introduced in this update, and was reserved for any mainline imports that originated in the main series from third generation onwards. These were considered to be some of the most powerful and difficult content at their inception, with the introductory member being Zenogar. There weren't incredibly drastic differences from your typical Zenogar. Naturally, it was faster, had more range on slams, and could dispel more fulgur bugs than usual. It also gained a handstand tail slam and the odd ability of detonating fulgur bugs from a distance. Zenogar did, however, have a scripted move based on how much damage you have dealt. It would scatter the bugs in a large area around it before roaring and summoning a huge pillar of thunder around it. The attack would completely one-shot through anything. You'd be lifted up and fall down unconscious. While you could iframe through it, the safest option was to just get out of its way. Devil Joe was also introduced alongside Zenogre and got itself some new toys to play with. It could chain a spinning tail into a pin and had a huge finisher attack where it would scoop up a massive amount of stone to bring it crashing back down. It was bigger, batter, faster, and physically dominating, as expected of the Frontier treatment. Last but not least, Brachydeos and the Blast status were introduced in the following 8.1 update, and it too had some revisions to its moveset. It could scrape its arms across the floor multiple times, leaving trails of quick exploding slime. It also had a flurry of punches attack similar to raging Brachydeos that sent out waves of explosions with every hit, and the absurd ability to pump massive amounts of slime into the ground for enormous AoEs. A cool feature of exotics was that their armor pierces could provide a free skill that didn't affect your skill count. See, normally you could only have 12 skills activated at maximum, and any other skills would be grayed out. The free skill you could get through exotic equipment actually bypassed this. Each exotic weapon also came built in with speed eating, apparently all of them with no exceptions. New hardcore monsters included Hardcore Abirugu and Hardcore White Monoblos. Abirugu has a longer, sharper tail as well as colored spikes around its body, and has a few new moves, such as using its tail to slam into the ground before swiping it and slamming it again. White Monoblos now had a longer horn and spikes and they were colored a deep orange and brown. It had a new rushing move that would be followed by a spinning attack and had the ability to lift up the ground around it. Now if you thought we were reaching godhood before in the last video, then you have haven't seen anything yet. No, what was included in G9 really allowed players to evolve the meta and carve a path into the future of Frontier. Let's check it out. G9 released November 18th, 2015, and with it, a third form of Raviente was introduced, known as Berserk Raviente for G-Rank. 
It was fought in the depths of Solitude Island, which we have previously visited with the first two snakes. Berserk demonstrated a mastery over fire, throwing up huge walls of lava, flooding the area with flames, and at later stages, a charged fireball held in its mouth that could wipe teams if it wasn't flinched. It also had the ability to cause geyser eruptions to launch the hunters, at which point it would rise up, open its mouth, and swallow you whole. Yeah, that was a straight up one shot. Combat involved the standard Raviente affair, breaking its body parts and causing staggers, with particular focus on a yellow paralysis crystal on its back that would cause a topple when broken. Players could reasonably expect months upon months of fights against this monster as it further boosted the Ravi weapon lineage to absurd levels, eclipsing most other options. Skills like solid determination and evolution weapons blew the meta out of the water. The fight operated with one support team and seven slayer parties, equaling a total of 32 hunters, within five phases instead of the typical nine from the previous entries. Team compositions would usually consist of a gunner, slashing weapon, and two blunt weapons to properly topple the monster and make it climbable. Each phase was the same combat flow, attack, then climb, break the crystal, KO Ravi, break head, break body, and break tail. The support party's main goal was to bring specific weapons and stop Raviente from being able to use certain certain bullshit abilities that would prevent the slaying parties from damaging it. The skills and weapons provided from this event were absolutely insane and required a large amount of preparation and cooperation to succeed in. As much damage as possible was necessary and when completed and grinded, players came out extremely powerful. Another new addition was Torrid Class, a bird wyvern that used solar energy to supercharge itself with thunder. There was a particular focus for this monster on discharging this energy as full blast, imbuing its wing spikes with electricity to throw it at hunters, and even beams that would flash when thrown, causing stun similar to Gypsaros. A nice touch that was added was that you could clearly see the bird's eyes close when KO'd, as they were fairly prominent on the beast's face. Again, this was another monster that had its hardcore introduced right away. Barioth was also introduced, and oh man did it get a makeover. Massive icicle blasts, huge tornadoes that could split apart into multiple instances, and even the ability to spit three ice blasts in a row. Couple that with the snowman status, and you could very easily get your entire face pulled inside out before you knew what hit you. Update 9.1 brought with it a new origin and exotic species, as well as one of the most influential additions to the series. First, we have the origin species of of Tiastra, Toa Tescatoru, who inhabited the Polar Sea and had command over the ice element. Not only was it able to summon a blizzard to freeze you in place if you stood still for too long, but it also had the ability to pull in waves of ice from the surrounding area, before blasting out AoEs from right under the hunter's feet. Fortunately, it shared the same squishy head that Tiastra has been known for, but could still take you by surprise if you let your guard down. Uragon was our fourth exotic to be introduced. It gained a couple new attacks such as charging up a nova from the earth, spreading exploding rocks in a circle before detonating them, and the garbage disposal attack. Uragon would roll in place, digging itself through the floor while rotating in a full circle. One side of the attack would spew out rocks with surprising coverage, and the other side would suck hunters in for a swift death. Now for another monster classification. Peerless monsters, known as Muso or extreme individuals, were the highest level of challenge that a single hunt could present to frontier players. The rewards were plentiful, a full box of supplies, utilities, and a unique item per monster to grant incredibly powerful decorations and armor. Every attack could be considered to be a one-shot. They hit fast, they trapped hunters, and required perfect adrenaline strategies to master and conquer. With each peerless monster, two versions of the quest existed. The Lesser Slay, or Repel, was a 20-minute affair where players could use the login boost feature to reduce damage and had a weaker variant of the target present. These typically gave less materials, but they were more accessible for lesser geared players. Players. Then there was the True Slay. The True Slay was to be completed in 10 minutes and featured a Muso at the height of its power, with health based attacks scripted, no defensive options, and a truckload of health to contend with. To give you an idea, Howling Zenogre had 64,800 on its lesser quest, and this was increased to a gargantuan 540,000 on the True Slay. Soloing any of these monsters was a mark of patience, skill, attrition, and the ability to throw roughly the same amount of power as the sun at a monster. Monster. The first to be introduced was Starving Devil Joe in G9, who was similar to Savage Devil Joe in design, but with a golden and red hide. 
It can shoot three balls of dragon energy, and when enraged, would perform a stomp attack that would create an explosion of dragon energy on impact. On top of the level of difficulty associated with a Musou, you actually had to fight two of these at the same time, as it was the only available quest during Musou week. Now Howling Zenogre was next in 9.1. This albino Zenogre would glow and crackle with power as it progressed through the fight, and its thunder abilities were augmented to ridiculous levels. It could disappear with a dash and combo this into a multitude of attacks such as charged slams, paralysis causing thunder, uppercuts, you name it. And the only way to tell what was coming next was paying attention to the minuscule head movements. It still retained the damage check attack of its vanilla cousin and had the audacity to start the fight with it. Howling very quickly became notorious with the overblown visuals and long reaching attacks almost epitomizing Frontier. Also in 9.1 was Thirsty Paria Puria. Unfortunately, I don't have as much info as I'd like on this specific Musou, but it was very similar in design to its supremacy variant. Other hardcore monsters include hardcore Lavasioth subspecies and hardcore Silver Hypnocatrice. The Lavasioth subspecies was brighter in comparison to its normal counterpart and had a tuft of scales on the top of its head as well as a more developed tail. It can create lava pools and slam into them to create a large explosion. The main changes for Silver Hypnocatrice was the inclusion of additional sleep attacks, such as time sleeping gas and the ability to spread its breath sleep gas around. Okay, here we go baby, G9's done, we got the new snake dragon boy, we got the Muso. what else could possibly be thrown at us? Let's take a look at G10. If you're like me and exhausted with all of the insane content presented in G9, then don't worry. G10 is a little more tame with its inclusions. Just kidding, there's new monsters and even more Musou to go over, as well as the conclusion of a mainline weapon brought over to Frontier. Released April 21st, 2016, G10 brought with it a new flagship known as Guanzurumu, the Emperor King Elder Dragon, an incredibly popular, destructive force of a fight. Guan, true to its royal name, commanded a squad of lesser wyverns known as Igura, to further boost its fire breath attacks, and these critters could even throw hunters off the edge of the map for an instant feint. It was fairly slow to start, methodical, and attacked powerfully, splitting the ground with slams and sending blasts of razor wind at enemies. It also had a hardcore mode released alongside it. In phase 2, Guan turns a deep black, snaps up its royal guard, and explodes with the dragon element. In this phase, not only does it get huge novas and burning floors of dragon element, but the screams, tremor, and wind that it throws out far surpass any sort of protection that was available at the time. Your only choice was to dodge or block, as these ancillary effects caused you to be immobilized for a huge amount of time. Guan was fairly well liked for the overwhelming sense of power and royalty that it exuded, and it's not hard to see why. It was also fought within the new Cloud Viewing Fortress Arena location. Two more exotic species hit the game in G10 in 10.1. These were Nargakuga and Stygian Zenogre. Nargakuga was fairly faithful to the second gen base, however it now had the ability to rain down tail spikes in a wide area, causing multiple hits and stun to any unfortunate enough to have missed their dodge. Additionally, it glowed bright blue in rage mode and left an after image when it strafed, as well as being able to chain two dash jumps with one another, where it would go invisible and leave behind bursts of wind that would trap you in a chip damage loop. Furthermore, it could chain tail slams and could attack you whilst turning with a huge sweeping wing arm attack. Stygian on the other hand introduced a new ailment entirely. Whilst it still had the usual dragon element and put its own spin on the damage check attack from its cousin, it could also cause items to be lost and weapon sharpness to fall if the player was hit too many times with dragon element. It would also combo spin juggle attacks as we've seen with a Biorugu and send out tornadoes full of dragon element to catch you unaware. Next up is our final origin species, Voljang, a volcanic relative of the badass monkey man himself, Rajang. Voljang was covered in a flint-like rock that would ignite in rage mode, and could send out waves of explosions with every punch. On top of this, it would burst with fire after certain attacks, and augmented its punch combos range by literally lighting itself on fire. In 10.1, a new Musou was released known as Ruler Guanzurumu. Visually, it now has red horns and glowing webbing on its wings, which seem to look as if they have been torn apart. Some new moves it has at its disposal include when it flies into the air and creates three large golden dust explosions, and a conal roar that can cause a one-hit KO 
KO Explosive Dust Fireball. As a final addition, Ruko Diora received a hardcore variant. It had better control over its magnetic breath and multiple new combo maneuvers, which it could do after a roar, such as following one with a body slam. And that's it for G10, and by process of elimination, all G updates. I feel like I'm missing something, but I'm not exactly sure what it is. It's probably nothing. Probably nothing. I'm pretty sure it's nothing. G10 marked the introduction of the Switch Axe into Frontier, but this wasn't your typical mainline iteration. Instead, various changes were made to have it fit in with the Frontier lifestyle. When originally announced, players were already worried that the dev team was relying too much on the mainline content due to the exotic species, and the idea of simply introducing a new mainline weapon didn't sit right with them. However, when the trailer dropped, it seemed like all worries were washed away, and the weapon was rebranded as Switch Axe F to differentiate it from its lower tier mainline counterpart. It introduced faster file reload times, faster switching between modes, advanced movement, and fast file regeneration, all within the base style. Earth style was brought back and focused on an upgraded vanilla mainline experience for the weapon, heaven style was incredibly fast, and storm style focused on royal guard. If the player guarded enough, they could unlock the blade form of their weapon, but not the typical blade form. Instead, they released a powerful blade beam to be used in combat, similar to the Monado in Xenoblade Chronicles. I'm really feeling it! The inclusion of this weapon actually caused the dev team to rethink their focus on the evasive playstyle since switch axes were so rewarding towards defensive players. On top of all of this, the weapon was available as soon as you hit G rank, unlike Tonfa which required you to complete several story quests to unlock. Okay, now, that really is it for the G series of expansions. There's many reasons why a lot of Western and mainline fans have a bad impression of Frontier. From the eccentric designs to how difficult some of the monsters can be, it's no surprise that when you look at the series in 2016 and see these one-hit Muso killing machines that you might be a little put off by the idea of Frontier as a whole. But simply looking at the design of the monsters or simply looking at just Muso is only a surface level examination of Frontier as a whole. There's so much content and so much depth. The fact that Musou required you to effectively change your entire playstyle doesn't say anything about Frontier as a whole, rather it was another option in a game full of possibilities. The next part of this history series will cover the final updates Z and Zenith. I'd like to give a big shout out and thanks to Sarah Symmetry and Ascalon for helping me out with the script and research. Additionally, thanks to Fist from Fist.moe and all of the community members for helping clarify certain aspects of the game, and thanks to Kapu and Eric for providing the in-game footage when possible. So before we get into the heart of the video, I want to briefly touch on a few things I excluded from the previous video, starting with Shiten or Solstice monsters, which are maxed out versions of monsters with a twist, specifically a max level conquest Disu Firoa, and a HR Supremacy Unknown. These monsters were more powerful, received new moves, and had some visual differences, especially Disu Firoa, who now has a red hue on its body which turns purple near the final phase. Imagine the effect you see on steel when you heat it with a torch. Defeating these monsters rewarded the player with materials that could be used to craft Shiten sigils, which were much less RNG dependent than your typical and allowed for players to have an easier time creating meta sets for other content. Shiten exclusive sigils also came with some weapon specific skill bonuses like fast charge for Tonfa or sword beam for sword and shield. And Disu and Unknown would split up these skills between the two of them for what had a possibility of being dropped. Moving on, a small mistake I made in the last video was excluding the Miru Muso. It was actually released in G10 and came with all of the same forms from your typical classification. Powerform gets a pin where he tries to pounce on you. If you don't dodge it, he brutally slams you with its claws, alternating between them before roaring, which is a one-hit KO. Speedform gets an attack where Miru runs around in a circle and causes a large bubble crystal dust explosion, which surprisingly doesn't give you crystallization. But does inflict a large amount of damage. Crystal Form gets an attack where it summons some crystal-like structures that it can jump around on before slamming on a targeted player. Ranged Form gets an attack where it jumps in the air twice and breathes two big lines of fire in a cross formation 
pauses for a bit, then breathes two more big lines again. Finally, we have hybrid mode, where Miru performs a huge attack, summoning tornadoes and launching them forward, followed by an explosion. Okay, so if you didn't watch the last video, I mentioned that I didn't have a lot of info on Thirsty Paria Puria. Thanks to Eric, who helps me get a lot of my footage, I now have further details to go over about this specific Muso monster. I believe I mentioned it before, but Thirsty was basically a visual recreation of Bloodbath Paria Puria, the supremacy classification of the monster. The main difference came from the extra power the monster brought forth as well as an updated moveset. Its main new attack was a charge where Thirsty P propelled itself with a large fart. I am not joking unfortunately, it follows this up with a 180 degree sweeping laser attack that will kill you regardless of defense. It also has the ability to inflict an upgraded version of the soiled status ailment that would not only prevent the use of items but also prevent sprinting and rolling. Generally, you want to not get hit at all, but if planning ahead for the chance this happens, you'd want to be sure to take deodorants along with you. When near death, Thirsty gets two new attacks which are both one hit KOs. It has the Supremacy Variance near death attack where it flies into the air and flaps for a bit before homing in and slamming down on a hunter. For the second move, it jumps into the air backwards, slams the ground, and then vomits an absolutely massive cone of rocks at a targeted hunter. This can be really difficult to avoid, even with extreme style. Now, with all the mist content out of the way, let's move on to the brand new features and monsters introduced in Z. The first thing to recognize about the Z updates is that the naming convention for the series got really jumbled up. Executives within Capcom determined that constantly rebranding the series would be bad for sales, which is funny considering that's one of the main aspects of Monster Hunter as a series. This really seemed to backfire on them, considering it was around Z and the lack of rebranding where the series began to plummet in the player base, as this handy graphic shows. Now this doesn't necessarily prove the lack of rebranding was a factor, but it is a correlation to make note of. So most players know of Z and ZZ or Z Zenith, but this can be broken up further similar to the G updates. For example, Z actually consisted of two major updates, being Z1 and Z2, and smaller interim updates in between these like Z1, Z1.1, and Z1.2. In fact, Z Zenith is basically just the Z3 update and after smaller updates they even dropped the Zenith title to simply stick with Monster Hunter Frontier Z. I would also like to point out that it is very difficult for me as a Canadian to say Z instead of Z, so you're welcome for the effort that I'm putting in here. To start things off, we'll be going over the initial Z1 update which released November 9th, 2016, containing the Extreme Style, Zenith Monsters, overhauls to the skill system, and more smaller features. Extreme Style was the final form of all the weapon styles, combining all three of them into one with new special moves in most cases. All 13 weapons at the time acquired the the ability to sprint while weapons ready by double tapping the analog stick in a direction instead of holding the sprint button. If you remember, this was an ability pioneered by the Tonfas. The unlock requirement at the time was GSR 300. All weapons handled differently, but some were more similar to previous styles than others. A good example of a drastic change comes from the longsword. Hunters now had access to an activated parry maneuver, where timing correctly allowed the player to perform a counterattack, and follow it up with either an evasive teleport attack or a multi-hit piercing stab maneuver. There's also a new meter to fill for longsword that rises as the player deals damage and parries, but will completely empty upon sheathing. This forces the player into a style where they have their weapon out at all times, something not typical to Longsword, but made easier thanks to the new sprinting mechanic. This gauge was tied into the new blade release action which consumes the meter. The move was similar to the spirit combo with extra damage and new animations. Each weapon had something unique about it, and extreme style is generally considered to be the best in-slot option for all endgame hunters. Speaking of the endgame and the meta, players had a new tier of equipment to work with, known as Zenith Gear. Zenith Gear was another way for players to bypass the skill cap limit, with many pieces offering the skill cap plus one effect, allowing for extra skills to be activated past the cap of 12. If the player equipped enough pieces of gear with these effects, they could have up to 19 different skills active at one time. Z weapons were some of the best in terms of attack and elemental damage only ever really being eclipsed by Raviente gear. They included hybrid sigil slots and a part breaker effect that helps in breaking zenith monster limbs. 
Hybrid Sigil slots allowed the user to slot in either a sigil or decoration based on their choice and customization, meaning that the player had more options when it came to expanding their skills. Unfortunately, Tonfa was nerfed around the inclusion of Z, effectively making the short mode useless and rebalancing the weapon to fit in alongside the other extreme style options. Aerial attacks were also fairly ineffective. The charm and originality of the Tonfa was heavily lost, and an attempt to remedy this would happen in a later update through the Tonfa rework, but we'll get to that further into the video. Something finally remedied in Z was the issue with the dose engine and hit lag. There was a horrific amount of hit lag within the series, which was more noticeable when using skills like Fencing Plus 2 or Mind's Eye Plus 2. Weapons like Sword and Shield and Long Sword were unbearable to play, but with the drop of the Z update, hit lag was updated, making Sword and Shield and Long Sword much more viable as damage dealers, rather than the Sword and Shield's original design as a support weapon. The PS4 edition of Frontier was also released around this point as well and caused huge server issues for the game at the time. A technical test caused major issues like players losing items and required the development team to roll back the servers. Following this was the actual release which put players into a 3-4 to four day queue before being able to access the game. To say players were pissed off would be an understatement, with people turning to Twitter to air their grievances towards the Monster Hunter Frontier account during the resulting server outages. Now, Zenith monsters were a different breed. Available at GR200, these were forms of existing monsters and the successor in difficulty level to hardcore and supremacy species, Espinas being the flagship for PC and Rathalos being the flagship for PS4. Unlike their relatives, these monsters had four specific hunting quests, and each escalated in difficulty every 200 GRs, 200 or 1 star being the weakest, and 800 or 4 star being the strongest. The loot pools for Zenith monsters were unique. You had standard materials, part break materials, common rares, and rare rares. Let's take a look at Rathalos for an example. You have the standard materials, such as shells and claws, etc., but then you have the wing break. You break both wings, you get the wing as a reward. There's the Zenith Wing, Zenith Mid Wing, Zenith High Wing, and Zenith Top Wing, each one corresponding to the four levels of Z quests mentioned previously. The rare drops referred to a plate slash mantle system that was present and obtainable at all levels, but was more common at higher levels. For Rathalos, you had the Light Scale, basically the Zenith Plate, that was a max 9% drop, and the Shining Gem, which was a 7% at max. Multitudes of these items were used for Z armor and weapons. As you may you remember from the last episode, Guanzarumu obtained incredible levels of roar and wind pressure that was far above any protection available at the time. These came to be almost mandatory for Zenith monsters, with increased roars, quakes, and wind pressure present in one form or another on most monsters introduced at this time going forwards. And it is the aforementioned Zenith skills that were now able to counter these ancillary effects. Now, the first new monsters to be introduced came in week 1 of Z's release. First we have Zenith Espinus, who acted as a flagship for Z on PC. Zenith Espinus presented the awful status of Zenith Poison, an effect that would deal damage depending on the tier of fight that you undertook. To put it into perspective, it was often that 4 star poison would kill you before you could sheathe your weapon, even with maxed health. The only way to cure this was to pick up purple shiny drops that said monster would drop during flinches or when flashed. Zenith Espinus was notable for being able to dispense clouds of poison smoke to trick unaware hunters into walking into it. It would combine fire, paralysis, and this new poison with deadly efficiency, and was fought in the Great Forest and the Flower Fields area. Next is Zenith Daimyo Hermitar. The iconic Hermitar and the first Zenith Carapacean was fought exclusively within White Lake and had massive silver claws. The usual tricks one would expect were present, such as huge water beams, scattering balls of water throughout the area, fast claw swipes, and using its massive shell to attack from below. But what made Zenith Hermitar unique is the new phase bestowed upon it. After a fast digging attack, the crab would emerge coated in an explosive green substance and would abandon the water element entirely in favor of a more explosive option. Using the massive claws as striking flints, it could burst the ground with fire whilst chasing an individual hunter down. It also gained a beam of dirt that would hit multiple times in a single second, all but guaranteeing stun and a high amount of damage. Another issue with the fight was the sheer Sheer amount of effort that was needed to break the shell, meaning that you would have to be very precise with your hits to get both the claw and the shell to drop. Zenith Kezu, fought in the swamp and arctic ridge, had incredible range on its thunder bursts and could scream with 
ear-shattering volume. Interestingly, it had two one-shot attacks that completely ignored defense and resistances, one where it would grab you from the ceiling and one where it would pin you. In both instances, it swallowed you whole, really pandering to the nightmare design of this original leech. The difficult thing about this monster was the chest and wing breaks, which were incredibly tough if you didn't focus on them religiously throughout the fight, and would lead to missing out on rare part break materials. Zenith Hypnocatrice came crashing in with an absurdly enlarged beak serving as its beefed up body part for the hunt. It was fought in mainly the Great and Bamboo Forest areas. This variant was much more physically inclined in its fighting style, attacking with ballerina spins, body slams, and earth-shattering kicks. Additionally, it came armed with the new Zenith status, known as Sound Asleep. If players were inflicted by this, the only possible way for them to survive was to be flinched by their comrades. Zenith Hypnocatrice would begin to sing a nightmare song that would rapidly drain all afflicted players' health, resulting in an almost instant instantaneous one-shot. Once the beak was broken, Hypnoc would use sleep attacks less often and its roar would be weakened. This coupled with decent impact zones meant that KO and focusing on the head was basically a requirement for parties wanting to take this beast down. A unique version of the two-star quest is another noteworthy feature, and was colloquially known as Moneybird. This event quest was your standard Zenith Hypnocatrice that rewarded a massive amount of tickets, which would be sold for an even more obscene amount of Zenny. It wasn't uncommon for for players to take two or three runs to replenish their wallets during a hefty spending spree. Moving on, the third week brought with it Z's first original monster. Introduced in the new Painted Waterfalls area, Xena Serisu was a water element flying wyvern that resembled Dora and Beiru in its design. It used the wing whips or tendrils more liberally, even being able to incorporate these into attacks whilst turning to face its enemy. It would scatter water bombs around the area and could turn a deep blood red upon enraging, gaining the ability to send waves of water out with backflips. This beast meant business, but you were able to sever the whips on its arms in addition to its tail, massively nerfing its arsenal and range. Xena Sarisu came with a hardcore variant and would be one of the last monsters to do so. Week 7 brought with it a new exotic, this time from Monster Hunter 4. The first 4th gen monster to be exported to Mezoporta was none other than the local edgelord Gormagala. As with all exotics introduced from this point on, it gained the new expanded Zenith Roar, as well as bringing with it the Frenzy Virus. Throughout the fight you would see expansions on this ailment, with wider reaching explosions as well as, much like Zenogr, the ability to scatter orbs of frenzy and detonate them all with a single roar. Upon taking enough damage, however, the spirit of Frontier possesses Megala and bestows upon it the new True Frenzy state, littering it with crystallized spikes and two purple feelers. All bets were off at this point, massive frenzy explosions flew around the field, meteors of the purple would rain from the sky, and Gore obtained an astounding range on a massive AoE attack. Gore's weapons were notable for including the darkness element previously used by Mariganasu. However, this came at the cost of a massive defense reduction. Week 10 introduced Zenith Blanganga, the apex of the notorious Ice Monkey. The Zenith part was the arms and it now gained the ability to cause massive explosions of ice just by punching the ground. It was fast, comboed frantically, and even possessed the ability to bowl a snowball for hunters to be caught in. At later levels, this was an incredibly fast health drain that pretty much guaranteed a cart unless you were stopped by a nearby wall very quickly. The week following Blanganga introduced Zenith Rathalos, who I mentioned functioned as the flagship for the PS4 Frontier release. Zenith Rathalos was able to cloak itself in fire to produce a health drain proximity mechanic. He borrowed a lot of moves from Zeru and Unknown. Upon enraging, it would take to the skies and slam down with Zenith Wind, before causing massive fire bursts to erupt around it. As mentioned in the previous example, the zenith part were the wings, and players would fight this beast in the Interceptor's base and volcano areas. This covers the initial release roadmap for Z. Following this was a week-long break, and then the introduction of the first big content update in week 13, also known as Z1.1. The big feature about this update was Diva Defense Interception, which was a two-week event added in Z. First, you had Blessing Week and Combat Week following that. During Blessing Week, players pick one of four colored gems to gather points and earn rewards. Each color provided a buff that would upgrade as you progressed. Once fully upgraded, players could move on to a gem of a different color. These buffs would be used for content within the combat week. 
During combat week, players within guilds would gather points in order to reach different score thresholds for rewards. You had a feline NPC giving you interception quests, which were in essence hunt-a-thons. There would be 3-5 monsters per quest, and you had feature quests to advance tiles on a board for the event in order to reach a boss or a secret chest area that gave you bonus points and other items you needed. Keiwaru Boru showed its face during the D.Va defense first huntable in week 14 and was the boss you were working toward. It was massive, even by Elder Dragon standards. KO here would pretty much increase its body temperature to volcanic levels, aiming to burn the interceptor's base to the ground. Throughout the fight, hunters would need to focus on burning body parts to dispel this heat, all whilst avoiding the burning ground, huge stomps, and the ability of Kyo to leap high in the air despite its massive frame. Upon entering phase 2, Kyo would tunnel away from its assailants before ex exploding with fire from the ground. A well-coordinated team could very easily make mincemeat out of the enemy, so it was more of a formality than anything, but as a spectacle, it was unrivaled. The final reward for each guild who met the point threshold was a fresh looking guild house with infinite diva blessings, without using the special items to bribe her to sing for you. Many of these new monster additions introduce new skills in order to allow the player to keep up with the difficult content. For example, KO introduced the Rush skill, which is similar to Challenger in small ways. It would cause the player to glow and buff them, and the glow would be brightened and more excessive depending on the tier of the ability. How did you get the glow in the first place? Well, attacking and blocking. Remember the renewed focus for the guard enthusiasts on G10? The skill was another amazing way to enjoy their playstyle. Level 1 grants plus 50 attack, level 2 grants an additional plus 80 attack for a total of 130, and cancels stamina usage while running with the weapon unsheathed. This skill will only reset once the player sheaths their weapon. Rush is a master class on how to incentivize your players to be more aggressive in combat. Week 16 introduced Zenith Akura Fushimu, who presented an odd dilemma. With the same awful tail cut mechanic as the basic species, where do you focus the zenith part? Simple, put it everywhere. You still had to suffer the awful ordeal of breaking the crystals off the claws with impact, breaking the claws itself with cut damage, and then going for the tail in order to neuter the thing. All whilst dealing with the new tricks that this zenith had to throw out. The new toys that this scorpion received came in the form of two infuriating new statuses, crystal paralysis and the new lingering paralysis. The Crystal Blight now combined with the immobility of Paralysis, meaning that you lost out on the vital mashing time if caught, leading to a pretty much guaranteed explosion for most victims. Additionally, if you survived, Paralysis would now stick around, interrupting your animations with a flinch regardless of what you were doing. It was like having a longsword user in your pocket for the time it was active. The monster itself used massive tail slams, and could even inject said crystals into the ground for a massive explosion. Week 18 brought with it the lesser slay of a brand new Muso and the true slay showing up in week 19. Many people's first experience with seeing Frontier content was this blinking Nargakuga. This Muso was well known for its incredible speed. It began every fight with a huge vacuum slash attack to draw in prey, where hunters would be pulled into a lethal blender of Razor Wind, and would repeat this at certain health thresholds throughout the battle. It could extend a rain of poison spikes to cover a large area, often chained to two tail slams in a row, and would strafe circles around hunters whilst disappearing from sight, not to mention its incredible albino appearance. The ridiculousness of the spectacle, as well as the fast-paced fights, made this monster almost the poster boy of frontier content going forward. With a health pool of 600,000, you had to be completely on top of your game to take this monster down, making sure to avoid its infamous juggle into a tail slam maneuver, and paying attention to which side it would scratch the ground to know when to dodge. The following week brought with it Zenith Tigrex, armed with a pair of metallic looking enhancements to its claws and a set of pipes that could put Corey Taylor to shame. That's a Slipknot reference. I didn't rate that. Sarah wrote that. That's a Slipknot reference. I do like Slipknot though. Big fan of Slipknot. Boasting huge concussive blasts during roars, as well as a new 360 degree roar tunnel. Much like 5th gen Brute Tigrex, it could also pin hunters down to rapidly gore them. The main addition to its arsenal was the inclusion of Frontier's take on the bleeding status. In comparison, mainline bleeding coddled hunters, stroking their hair and telling them it'll all be fine if they just lie down for a bit. 
Frontiers Bleeding took the more realistic approach of stabbing you in an alley and spitting on you until you bled out. The only ways to survive were to use an anti-bleed ball or to beg that you outhealed it, as your health would rapidly drain regardless of your actions. Tigrex was one of the more tame Zeniths, but could still demolish you if you disrespected it. Now, Tigrex was released on the 20th week of Z's lifespan. There wouldn't be many more features released until week 24, which marked the major Z 1.2 update, and brought with it a brand new exotic, Shigaru Magala. Following its juvenile form, Shigaru Magala was then introduced, with much of the same general improvements as well as more physical attacks presented from Gore. Upon hitting the True Frenzy state, it gained a new appearance reminiscent of a butterfly, with new lavender highlights and a single twisted horn. In this form, it can now trap hunters with a zenith level roar and spawn a frenzy blast beneath its feet for an instant and deadly combo. The weapons in particular use the light element found previously on Zeru Reusu in contrast to the darkness found in Gore's weapons. The following week brought with it Zenith Hugh Jikiki, who came with the previously introduced bleed mechanic, as well as being the monster that anyone with a Reddit account will use to discredit Frontier based on the design alone, despite, well, you know, Nergagante existing. Hyuji forsake the status aspects of the vanilla version for a strictly non-elemental approach, completely focusing on sharp spikes and the lightning summoning of the highland to attack. This was reflected in its drops, with the shrunken sack replacing the previous status sack. Zenith Hyuji glowed gold when it howled, and could summon a single spike to pierce and impale hunters through a unique mechanic. Hyuji's eyes would glow red and a circle would surround your HUD. As it closed in, hunters could time a block to reflect the spike back at Hyuji, guaranteeing a KO and a stagger. Ironically, breaking the Zenith spikes would stop this from happening, making this Zenith one of the few monsters whereby the fight would get harder after the the break. Zenith Gyaorugu arrived five weeks later with an anchor for a tail and a slew of offensive options. The usual tricks for this one, charged ice shots, rolling like an Uragon, throwing out spikes, however, the ice that encased its tail could be broken to trigger a stagger. Zenith Gao gained some new charged tail spins to stun hunters, as well as a fancy new AoE where it would freeze a cylinder around it. Hunters would have their stamina drained until empty, at which point they were frozen in place whilst their health drained at a massive rate. Your options were to distance and wait it out, or attack the tail and hope for a lucky trip. And that's all for Z1 and its interim updates. Following this was about a five week break of content before moving on to the next major update, Z2. Let's take a look now. So we're on to Z2, which is actually still Z and not ZZ or Z Zenith or Z Zenith or Triple Z or Zeta Gundam or Double Zeta or whatever. It's not surprising at all why people began to find this extremely confusing. This update released July 5th, 2017 and marked the 10th anniversary of Monster Hunter Frontier. One of the biggest inclusions in this update was a new feature called Hunter's Road, an inclusion that completely replaced Sky Corridor and involved fighting through endless floors of monsters while excluding puzzles and the Dure Mudira final boss. You started on floor 1 and were randomly given two monsters to pick from. You could spend points on various items from the shop such as potions, antidotes, etc. and started with a set amount of points to spend. Each monster had a point value associated with it based roughly on difficulty. Elders like Haruto would give you more than Rathalos for example. You also got road points equivalent to half of the monster's value which you keep outside of road and could spend in the road store. Each floor you would pick one of the two monsters, fight it, prepare for and pick the next one, fight it, and so on. Each player got three carts, you could use them all or abandon the quest at any time and keep all of your road points. There was no definitive end. Exotic started appearing at either floor 7 or 8, and at floor 10, you'd fight Frontier's version of White Fatalis. In its second phase, it does a specific move that's more or less free damage if you know what to expect. In groups, it was possible to lock White Fatalis into this one move by dealing enough damage, making the fight pretty easy. After White Fatalis, Zeniths of increasing rank started appearing. Generally, people did road with the intention to at least get past floor 10. You needed to beat White Fatalis three times to be able to 
to buy all of its maps on the road store and you could only buy a limited amount of them every week. White Fatalis decorations were some of the best in the game all the way up until shutdown, so regular players often did road at least three times a week to farm Fatalis mats. In the road store, you could buy pretty much anything, including exclusive decos and mats for exclusive road armor, which was extremely effective. Unfortunately, this resulted in there being no point to hunting a lot of monsters since you could get almost anything you needed through Road. As the updates went on, they added more monsters to Road, with Z Zenith adding a sizable amount. Moving on to new monster inclusions, we have the new unique monster known as Eruzerion. Imagine if Zenogre changed teams and decided to be an Elder Dragon for a day. A monster that had many attacks, including ones that would turn its entire body into a hurt box, combo moves, and the ability to freeze you into place with chip damage due to the fiery floors. All things considered, it was brutal, with a second phase that had AoEs to rival the best of them. Lupian in appearance, with some brilliant legato strings as the backtrack in the second phase, plus the absurd Jekyll and Hyde fight fighting style of using each side of its body for a certain element. Upon dispelling each element, you would be rewarded with a stagger, however, the legend of this monster would reach new levels a few weeks later. Before that, let's go over a few more monster additions. Zenith Mito Garen blasted into Z2 with some new counter mechanics. From two star quests onwards, it would use multiple teleports or flash steps if you prefer to intimidate enemies. However, it was functionally harmless until it appeared in front of you. At this point, if hunters evaded a blast and attacked in a small enough time frame, you would be rewarded with a brief but guaranteed stagger. Outside of this mechanic, Zenith Mito would utilize the rapid speed and vacuum tornadoes of other such fire zeniths to inflict the devastating extreme fire blade to hunters. And with the inclusion of the stylish assault up Zenith skill for a lot of the weapons and armor made this an incredible popular choice for seasoned frontier players. Next up was Zenith Ruko Diora, who could arguably be considered to be one of the most versatile Zenith monsters and introduced the annoying Zenith Dragonblade. Able to cause quakes, roars, and wind all at the same time, it demonstrated fearsome power. Zenith Ruko's beams would hit multiple times, meaning that a split second guard point wouldn't be enough and you would be drained down to your last instance of HP without dodging or distance. At 4 star level, it gained an instant one shot attack, whereby the only tell was the position of the monster's wings. The magnetism was brutal. What would usually knock you for a few in G rank would be a one shot under most conditions with the Zenith. Zenith Ruko often mixed in some of the more unfriendly aspects of second gen elders such as insta jumps and insta charges, making it a complete counter to the telegraphed attacks that players began to adapt to in the later generations. Following Ruko was Zenith Plesios. A name synonymous with bad hit zones, pain, and suffering. This Plesioth could juggle hunters with double hip checks, gained the ability to roar, and used an interesting green gel-like substance. This gel would be scattered around the battlefield, and if hunters were caught in it, it would deal fixed damage at an alarming rate whilst trapping them. Plesioth would always begin its fight by coating itself in this gel before screaming. Do enough damage, however, and you could trigger a massive stagger where the fish would remain motionless for over 20 seconds, after which its moveset was incredibly nerfed. It was fast, clean, and above all, actually pretty fun, despite the nightmarish appearance of course. The next release of content brought with it Z2.1 and the first monster to be introduced was Amatsu, another exotic from 3rd gen boasting Zenith Roar and Quake. The main significant change with the Storm Dragon was the usage of Dragon Element in its G rank second phase. Much like previous exotics, it would drop Dragon and Water Meteors in combination with tornadoes of much of the same element. Nothing much else existed above and beyond this exotic aside from these elements and charged AoEs in terms of mechanics, but you'll see that later, I'm sure. Now, Zenith Inagami. An Inagami with a much more powerful tail as its Zenith part. Most of its attacks involve slamming its tail to cause Zenith Quakes, or swiping at the player with it, as well as most of its attacks causing Zenith Sleep. They also cause Bamboo to grow quickly and impale the player while they are sleeping. Its tail, which is somewhat like a flower, alternates between 
a bloomed and not bloomed state. When bloomed, clouds of sleep gas accompany many of its tail attacks, making them even more dangerous. One of these attacks involves it planting its tail into the ground and moving it underground to burst underneath the player. If this attack is dodged and the tip of its tail is attacked before Zenith Inagami withdraws it, it causes pain that knocks it on its side and stuns it briefly. Moving on to Amuso, ask any seasoned Frontier player about Peerless Eru Zerion and I promise you they'll wince. Introduced just before Z Zenith Power Creep, this Peerless variant was a monstrosity, boasting a gargantuan 1 million health to be drained in just 10 minutes. It was so fierce, so fast, and presented countless roars into AoEs that one single slip up would spell immediate death. Whilst the same could be said for any Peerless, it was the addition of the ridiculous Zenith Fire and Ice simultaneously that presented even further danger out in the arena. It took nine months from release for this beast to be soloed. The decorations, known as fonts, were invaluable, boasting decent points and offensive skills such as strong attack and point breakthrough, and a decent reward for such a grueling fight. It's no exaggeration to say that this was one of the hardest fights in the entirety of Frontier. Moving on to the Z 2.2 updates, we have Zenith Torrid Class. Its Zenith part is its wings, and it flaps them to cause Zenith wind as well as huge bursts of electricity. Most of its attacks cause Zenith Thunderblight as well. Some of its attacks involve it stomping on the ground and causing a burst of lightning around it, throwing its lightning-infused quills and flash-bombing the hunter before trying to hit them with a huge laser. While they're stunned, that does extremely fast damage over time, which can kill the hunter almost instantly. Zenith Dorogirosu represented another entry in the Zenith Dragon roster, and a relentless one at that. Zenith Dora included a massive scripted sequence that ended up being typical for a lot of later monsters in Frontier. In Dora's case, it was a hover, a slam, and a roar, and from 2 star onward, a forward facing bite. A couple of interesting notes about Dora Girosu is that it had a pitfall trap of its own, guaranteeing death for any player that was caught by it. However, if the monster itself was caught in it, you would get the main series level of trap time, which was indispensable with the amount of power you could throw out. Dora also had the wonderful example of being a zenith that was completely castrated by its own break, being unable to fire beams, bolts, or do any sort of significant damage in comparison. Most dragon attacks after horn break would instead summon random dragon thunder around it, rendering it basically harmless. Alright, this is a big one. Uh, Muso Dure Mudira, or otherwise known as Arrogant Dure Mudira, is one of the many Muso monsters introduced in Frontier. Just like his first and second district forms, he's fought within the Sky Corridor locale and you'll already be familiar with it. However, the first major difference you'll see is his appearance, as well as his element he attacks with. Now bleached and purple, unlike his normal navy blue coloration, as well as rocking darker to lighter blue crystals around its head, tail, and wings. His Muso form now deals thunder element damage, unlike his previous form that deals ice damage to hunters. This can be seen by his various attacks that would normally be ice particles, but now appear to be purple lightning bolts in AoEs. Muso Dure Mudira can still inflict its infamous corrupted poison on hunters on many of its attacks. Even guarding some of these will still inflict you with deadly poison, lowering defense and depleting your health at a rapid rate. This Muso does come with a few new moves, as well as having its original moveset from the first and second district forms. First is its introductory roar into a large lightning vortex. Second is its multiple beam move. Muso Du Re Mudira will perform a jump attack to gain distance away from the hunter and fire a purple beam in front of it. Then a second beam to the right, a third beam to the left, and then finally it does a final beam that sweeps from right to left. Its last new move will have it perform a quick slide towards the hunter. If this isn't evaded or blocked, it will send the hunter flying across the room for massive damage. Straight out after that, it will then proceed into a zenith tier roar. The infamous part about this Muso was the fact that it had sped up animations compared to its first and second district forms. These animations are extremely fast, and hunters familiar with the normal Dure Mudira fight will see this straight away. One of his hated moves among many hunters is his infamous stomp slash spin combination move. It's sped up so much that the hitbox on the move is highly janky and inconsistent, which leads to easy carts and feints. It's also one of the many 
many reasons why people generally don't want to fight this particular Muso. In fact, many don't want to fight this fella due to how much of a downgrade it is perceived to be in comparison to its regular fight. After beating it via Repel or True Slay, you'll be rewarded with incredibly strong decoration mats to craft decorations at the smithy, as well as materials to craft its transmog. Now another 4th gen addition, Seregio swooped in with the debilitating new Frontier Bleed ailment as well as an upgraded roar. Throwing out blade scales that dwarfed its main series cousin, it could scatter them in pools around it to explode with golden light, as well as surprising bursts of speed. It was during these dive bombs that this freaky pinecone's wings would glow red, and it was during these small windows that a hidden opportunity resided. Much like Gogamoa or Zenith Hyuji, damaging this monster during this time would set off a unique stagger, causing high damage and allowing hunters to create their own opportunity through aggression. It was an impressive sight, reds and golds barreling its way towards you at Mach 7. Zenith Gazura Bazura, a very popular zenith that several people in the English community would probably call the best. I'm sure you've seen the bongo memes. It has a poison form where it can inflict zenith poison and strength form just like regular Gazira. Its zenith part is its claws and it uses them to cause huge zenith quakes in its strength form. One of its most interesting attacks include one where it digs underground and resurfaces from one of several poison quicksand traps. If you hit it when it peeks out, it gets stunned and vulnerable for a short while. There's also the infamous bongos where it slams the ground with its claws, alternating between them and the bulldozer where it pushes a large volume of sand to trap the hunter in before forming it into a ball and throwing it behind it like a boulder. The final monster of Z2 is Zenith Anoropatisu. Its zenith part is its horn and it uses it to slam the ground causing zenith quakes in conjunction with dragon attacks such as a laser sweep similar to Ruko's. One of its attacks involves jumping into the air and attempting to impale the hunter with its horn when landing, which is obviously a one-hit KO if it lands. The last big update had the Tonfer receive a new rework, now gaining the ability to EX evade in the air and having its motion values updated to be more effective in both short and long form. EX evasion, for those unaware, is the special form of evade exclusive to Tonfa and would consume the energy gauge for the weapon when used. This was the resurgence of Tonfa after the unfortunate nerf near the start of the Z updates. It was finally back as a viable option for weapons. Not exactly the king of weaponry, but a strong contender for being one of the best. With all of Z2 out of the way and the end of the Taiwanese servers run on Monster Hunter Frontier, we're on the verge of the end. It's time to take a look at the final updates of the series. Here we are. The final set of updates, also known as Z Zenith, but effectively functioning as Z3, and eventually just reverting to the Z moniker in later interim updates. Released September 26th, 2018, this would not only begin the end of content updated, but the end of Frontier as a whole. It introduced a brand new weapon, a new unique monster, new Zenith species, and two new Musos. The first entry to talk about, and possibly the biggest inclusion within this set of updates, is the brand new weapon type Magnet Spike, possibly one of the most unique weapons introduced to the Monster Hunter series as a whole. The Magnet Spike was brought to Mesoporta by a man named Graham. He found people using this spike in the western region of the Monster Hunter world, not to be confused with Monster Hunter world, and the weapon came in two modes, Blade and Blunt, with Blade being your more nimble option and Blunt more slow and methodical. Blade mode consisted of fast attacks. When the power gauge was filled, you could perform charged attacks that had iframes each time you used them. It was similar to Tonfa's with EX evades or fade slashes from Switch Axe and Longsword. Then there was Blunt Mode, aka the Hammer Killer. Magnet Spikes killed hammers or any blunt weapon in the game 99% of the time against most monsters through utility and sheer destructive force. Your character becomes significantly slower in exchange for better damage output, forcing users to rely more on position and patience. They had a move similar to Monster Hunter World's iteration of the hammer where you could slam two soft hits and then finish up with a powerful home run swing attack that charged the longer you kept the button pressed. Using 
using the weapon charges it as you fight. When the weapon is fully charged, it can be magnetized and provide an attack buff for a period of 80 seconds. Each mode has an independent charge, so you can fully charge blunt mode and then switch to blade mode to charge it as well. One of the other main features is the attract and repel function, which allows the user to mark an area and launch themselves toward it. Using this action consumes part of the charge gauge. Finally, there was a quick time event super move known as the magnet pin. Hitting the monster enough will apply a moving magnetism effect onto it, which informs the player it is ready to be pinned. Once the pinning process begins, a quick time event will begin and the player will keep the monster in place until the pin is completed or they fail the event. Performing the pin successfully leads into a finisher attack that has an extremely high motion value and will deal an incredibly large amount of damage. Where the finisher hits is dependent on where the magnet marker is currently targeted on the monster, so players looking to optimize their play can choose specific limbs to perform this action on. Week 1 of the update brought with it Frontier's final unique monster, Boga Badorumu, a large blue monster that utilizes blast in a way similar to Brachydios in Rage Mode. Most of its attacks involve using its huge strength to slam the ground, causing large zenith quakes and releasing a gas that causes large explosions. It starts off as a regular monster, but halfway through the fight uses a big one-hit KO attack where it surrounds itself in exploding gas and turns into a zenith in the process. What? Boggy's zenith part, its arms, become more powerful and can only be damaged and broken after this has happened. Interesting fact, Boggy is apparently what Gesura was hiding from in the White Lake. Next up we have two Zenith Inclusions and a Muso. First up is Zenith Baru Regaru. This is the Zenith Inclusion most people consider to be the worst. Its Zenith part is its tongue and it only ever uses it to suck up blood of hunters, meaning it only has access to its blood form and water form, with no poison or paralysis. Like regular Baru Regaru, it uses its tongue for a variety of attacks, wielding it like a flail to inflict Zenith bleed in conjunction with blood and water attack. Next is Zenith Gravios. Its zenith part is its stomach and it uses it to cause a large amount of fiery explosions similar to an actual volcano. On top of this, it can also use a large fire laser, the same as regular Gravios and often causes zenith quakes as well as inflicting zenith fire blight with its fire attacks. On to another Muso, this time with Boga Badurumu. It didn't take long for the flagship of Z Zenith and the only unique Zenith species to get a makeover. This variant on the explosive Mist Wyvern was much faster than the frankly pedestrian vanilla version. It too sported a health pool of a cool 1 million and could trigger a second explosive blast after all of its primary explosions. At certain health gates throughout the battle, much like many other of its battle-hardened classification, it would produce a staggering amount of fog and a massive roar explosion combo seen only in the base species' second phase. The Lesser Slay didn't differ too much either, giving hunters a not insignificant 600,000 HP to contend with. The second explosions were massively disrupted but the timing was all pretty much the same, making this more of a war of attrition and consistency. Moving on, we have what are known as the final set of updates for Z Zenith, aka Z3.1. There's not much to go over here besides three monster inclusions, those being two Zeniths and the final Muso. Zenith Tycoon Zamaza, the tankiest Zenith with 125,000 more HP than Ruko at 4 star. It is generally agreed to be the best Zenith in Z3. Its Zenith parts are its claws and it only has two phases, skipping regular Tycoon's rock slash mud phase, and has a number of interesting attacks including hitting hunters out of its cave by uppercutting them with its hammer claw and spinning around like a Beyblade and spinning towards the hunter in its second phase. What? It can cause Zenith Quakes with its Hammer Arm and Zenith Thunder Blight in its second phase with most attacks. Zenith Haruto Marugu. For some reason, this Zenith is pretty squishy, having less health at Z4 than many other monsters of similar classification that aren't even Elders and almost half as much as Z4 Tycoon. Its Zenith part is its head and it utilizes a variety of metal attacks including several that are upgrades of regular Haruto attacks. It creates metal spikes, metal boomerangs, metal rain, can fire metal discs at hunters after flying into the air and has the infamous ball attack regular Haruto has, albeit weaker for some reason. Rather than creating a ball and running a circle around the arena, it goes straight into the air and attempts to slam down on a hunter, which is much easier to evade. 
As Monster Hunter started with Rathalos, Frontier came to the end with another. The peerless version of Zero Reuzu was a brilliant ruby and white. Focusing on heavy amounts of one-shot attacks, it could surround itself with a shield and target hunters with pinpoint accurate light beams, cause massive pillars of light to burst in a cylinder around it, and even borrowed a few tricks from Valstrax. Upon entering the historical site, Frontier players would be greeted with a distant red comet in the sky before a flash and the Musa would come screaming down to earth. Breaking the head proved invaluable in reducing the roar to acceptable decibels, and you would have to be at the top of your game to survive its onslaught. This was an incredibly combo-happy fight, and whilst it sported less health than some of the other Musos, it was no slouch. An appropriate end to the craziness that was Frontier. As I mentioned in the previous videos, Mesoporta Square had a lot of updates and visual overhauls throughout its lifetime. Since this is the final video in the series, I wanted to give a quick tour of the main hub as well as showing off a few additional locations. Hopefully this gives you a good idea of what you could expect in between hunts. Unfortunately, there aren't a lot of details on the end of Monster Hunter Frontier, which shut down December 18th, 2019. Capcom didn't even confirm its end until over a year of them knowing they were going to shut it down. It was an abrupt announcement, only six months before they planned on ending things, and Capcom didn't talk about it at all after that. There was no reasoning or explanations for the sudden end, leaving players to simply speculate that it had to do with the release and popularity of Monster Hunter World, or perhaps they wanted to update their online development with the release of Monster Hunter Online. Regardless of their reasoning, a lot of players were left out in the rain and had to scramble to finish whatever their goals were within the series, as well as a few dedicated players working to preserve the data of the series before it was wiped from existence. What's there to really say about the player's response? A long time online Monster Hunter experience of 12 years was ending and with it, all of the uniqueness and mechanics, the design of monsters and certain abilities were going to be completely wiped. A lot of players from Frontier veterans to people that wanted to play the game seemed to yearn for the previous designs and mechanics to show up in mainline releases. 
but due to Japanese culture and the animosity between the core Monster Hunter development team and the Capcom Online Games division team makes that seem unlikely. Instead, the most we see is Capcom cherry-picking Frontier staple mechanics and implementing them into newer games, with little to no credit toward Frontier introducing them. Things like mantles and boosters being picked out of Frontier's design reject bin, it's like the game never existed. On the other side of things, we have players who never experienced Frontier almost disgusted at the idea of it. A combination of a lack of info in the West, plus the toxic ideology of players not wanting their exclusive monsters and mechanics to make it over to the mainline releases. It's sad to say the least. Monster Hunter has always been a unique experience, and some of its most unique design elements will never see the light of day. Who knows what the future holds? Maybe one day we will see Frontier inclusions within mainline releases. Maybe we will see the revival of Frontier in one way or another. But for today, and as the final point in this video, I will say that everything I learned in this series about Frontier completely opened my eyes about how deep this series went and how influential it was to mainline Monster Hunter games. I wish I could have had the opportunity to play it when it was alive, and as a Monster Hunter content creator, veteran, and longtime fan, all I can say is that I'm disappointed to see a piece of Monster Hunter history gone. I'd like to give a huge shout out and thanks to Sarah Symmetry and Ascalon for helping out with the script and research. I say that in every video within the series, but seriously, these guys poured their knowledge into my script and I wouldn't have been able to write something like this with the amount of time I currently have if it wasn't for these two. You guys really don't know how much work they put into writing detailed explanations of monsters and mechanics that I was able to use in the script. They really put effort into getting this video out and keeping it as accurate as possible, so be sure to check them out and I will put their details in the description. Additional thanks to Fist from Fist.moe and all of the community members for helping clarify certain aspects of the game. This community has done so much and is currently doing so much for Frontier's legacy. They deserve so much credit for things that are going on behind the scenes and I can't stress enough how important their work is. Finally, thanks to Kapu and Eric who provided a large portion of the footage throughout the series. An incredibly large portion in each video is provided by them and helps make the video editing process extremely easy. Shout out to Ralador, Odie, Chimchamp, Waffle Tractor, and everyone else who provided footage when they could. It's greatly appreciated. This is the last Frontier History video. If you enjoyed this video and found it informative, if you enjoyed this series and found it informative, consider supporting the channel by liking, commenting, and subscribing. Again, it only takes a couple of seconds and helps support me in my goal of creating this content for you all. If you didn't like the video, damn, let me know anyway and I'll see what I can improve. Thanks so much for watching everyone, thanks so much for taking part in this series, and I will see you in the next video.